uh, Leonardo, we are uh, live. Sergeants, can you start your recordings, please? Computer recording is started. Cloud is recording. Backup is rolling. Okay, at this time, Sergeant Martinez, you're opening. Good morning and welcome to today's new remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Public Safety. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video to minimize disruption. Please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at the following email address, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you very much for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good morning, and thank you for joining today's virtual hearing of the Public Safety Committee. I'm Council Member Adrian Adams, Chair of the Public Safety Committee. I'd like to acknowledge that we are joined by my colleagues, Council Members Cabrera, Menchaca, Riley, and I see Council Member Powers as well. And I'm sure many others will be joining momentarily. Last June, Governor Cuomo issued an executive order requiring that every city in New York engage their residents and develop a plan to reform policing by April 1st or possibly risk losing billions of dollars in state funding. The order was prompted by the mass demonstrations that took place in New York City and around the world after George Floyd and Breonna Taylor were killed by police in 2020. While their deaths may have been the catalyst, I would be remiss if I did not recognize that communities impacted by over-policing have been organizing and demanding police accountability for decades. So, with that as a backdrop, you would think that the administration would take their mandate to develop a meaningful reform plan seriously. Instead, the administration dragged its feet for months and rushed through a half-hearted community engagement process. I hope that the hearing, I hope that the hearing this committee held last month would have spurred them into real action. Instead, here we are today, roughly six weeks away from the April 1st deadline, and New Yorkers have yet to see a draft of the administration's plan. For this reason, the council has stepped in and introduced an initial slate of a dozen reforms that would make structural changes, increase transparency, and reduce the NYPD's footprint. At today's hearing, the Public Safety Committee will consider intro 2209, which I sponsored. This bill will require that the police commissioner be confirmed by the council through the advice and consent process and reduce the police commissioner's term from five years to four years. I introduced this bill because New Yorkers deserve a police commissioner who has a zero tolerance policy when it comes to officer misconduct. The current practice of simply docking vacation days when an officer's actions or inaction causes harm is a slap in the face to the victim, their families, and to their communities. Take, for example, the tragic death of Tony Wells, whose mother Elizabeth is here with us today. Tony, a young woman who desperately sought help, but was ultimately strangled by her abusive partner because the NYPD officers assigned to the call never even got out of their patrol car. These officers clearly failed to uphold their most basic duty. And because of that, a bright young woman was viciously murdered. It is outrageous and infuriating that those officers were merely docked a few vacation days and placed on a short probation period. This disciplinary outcome makes it clear that no matter what they do, officers will be allowed to hide behind their badges. Requiring that the council confirm the police commissioner can help ensure that anyone who fills that role is committed to real reform and accountability. Yes, accountability from day one. The committee will also hear intro 1671, which I sponsored. This bill 
would require the NYPD to report quarterly on traffic and checkpoint stops, including information on how many of those stops resulted in arrests or summons being issued. The reporting requirement would allow us to clearly see if the NYPD is unfairly targeting certain communities for disparate enforcement. The committee is hearing several other bills, which, will, which I will only mention briefly, because I know that my colleagues will want to speak to the details in just a moment. Intro 2220, sponsored by, by Council Member Steve Levin, would eliminate qualified immunity for police officers. Resolution 1538, sponsored by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, calls upon the state to remove the police commissioner's exclusive authority over officer discipline with regard to the CCRB's recommendations. And a pre-considered resolution sponsored by Council Member Francisco Moya that calls upon the state to require that NYPD officers live within the five boroughs of New York City. We're very proud of this police reform legislation package and have already received great recommendations from advocates on ways to make them even stronger. Today, we look forward to continuing that conversation with them, with members of the public, and with representatives from the administration. With that, I will now let each sponsor speak briefly about their bill. Um, this is Daniel Addis, the Council of the Committee on Public Safety. Um, I see that uh, Council Member Levin is present. Council Member Levin, do you wish to give an opening statement? I do, thank you very much. Uh, I wanna thank our chair um, for uh, bringing this package of legislation um, to, uh, to this hearing. I think that this is a, in a very important um, series of bills to be hearing today. Um, and I, um, I think that this represents many months of work by council and council staff um, to address the systemic issues that, um, that we've been seeing for, for far too long in our country and in our city. Um, and honestly, it's never, it's never, oh, it's never the most opportune time to do reform. Um, there, um, you know, we don't deny that we've seen um, uh, a spike in, in, in murders in the last year. Uh, we don't deny that we've seen a spike in shootings in the last year. Um, but, and that's, that's very concerning and we need to be working um, with every strategy that we can to address it. Um, but it's, it's important that we carry through with our commitment to do reform. And that's what these bills are doing. Um, you know, after the budget fight of this past summer, when the parallel crises of COVID and its economic fallout divide, collided with the racial justice reckoning following the death of George Floyd, um, I took a lot of criticism and tried to examine the ways in which the city council could address some of the accountability issues with the NYPD and see if we could begin to repair the relationship between police and community. I think that with this package of reforms, and I'm very proud to be sponsoring the uh, legislation to remove the defense of qualified immunity for police officers, we can make some progress in restoring that vital piece of public trust. The need for this reform keeps repeating itself in the headlines. In Rochester earlier this year, officers pepper sprayed a nine-year-old girl having a mental health crisis. And last week, a Buffalo grand jury dismissed charges against the officers who shoved an elderly man to the ground and left him bleeding in need of, of hospitalization. And I think we all saw the video of that. Civil courts provide a much needed source of recourse and reparations for victims of egregious misconduct. This allows for a path of accountability for officers and repair and redress for victims. It allows the system to attempt to address the harm caused in these situations. 
The support for this reform, and this is very important, spans the political spectrum with criticisms from two Supreme Court justices rarely on the same side, Justice Sonia Sotomayor and Justice Clarence Thomas. In addition that we've seen that in legislation around the country, in Colorado, for instance, the bipartisanship for this legislation, uh, for this type of legislation um, is, um, is manifest. The Fourth Amendment standard is that 2020 hindsight should not be used to judge police actions if they acted reasonably. This bill does not change that. And I hope that you will join me in supporting this necessary legislation. Um, I want to thank um, my staff that worked on this legislation as well um, as council staff, um, uh, Kelly Taylor, Ed Atkin, uh, Daniel Addis, um, um, Brian Crow. Um, uh, and, uh, and I really uh, am very appreciative to the chair for bringing this to the, to the council today. Thank you. Thank you very much, council member Levin. We have also been joined by council members Powers, Holden, Yeager, Rodriguez, and Rosenthal. And I will now turn it over to our moderator, Committee Counsel Daniel Adis, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Adams. Um, as I said before, I'm Daniel Adams, Counsel of the Committee on Public Safety at the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. Members of the administration who are testifying will not be muted during the Q&A portion of the administration testimony. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will call on you shortly for the oath, then again when it is time to begin your testimony. During the hearing, if council members would like to, raise, uh, to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer questions. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov if you have not already done so. That's testimony at council.nyc.gov. The deadline for written testimony is 72 hours after the hearing. Before we hear from the representatives of the administration, we will hear from Elizabeth Rivera, mother of Tony Wells. Um, Ms. Rivera, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer then give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin delivering your testimony. Thank you, Council. Mm -hmm. Ms. Rivera, we welcome you. Thank to, you for having me, guys. Thank you. It's an honor to be room. here. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, I would uh, like to say my story. Um, like I said, once again, thanks for having me. Um, basically, I would like to say what happened. I'm a little nervous, so just you know, bear with me. My nerves are back. So um, as many of you must, I mean, my night full, on December 27th, my daughter, Tony Wells, made a call to 911 for help. Excuse me, guys. <laughs> acting, saying that her husband was acting weird and she feared for her life. Oof. A second call was made by the neighbor saying Tony was screaming, saying he's gonna kill me. Two NYPD officers were dispatched to do a wellness check. However, officers Wing Hong Lu and Wei Wei Jaber refused to get out of their car because it was simply too cold. As an hour later, a third call was made to go into the, to Tony's home where her body was found, discovered unresponsive with one, one and a half year old daughter crying over her lifeless body. As a mother, I'm sad, I'm hurt, I'm angry because my daughter made a call because she feared for her life and she was scared. She waited for help. She wanted to be rescued and it was never sent to her. It's more difficult and more hurtful to know that these two officers who were sent to check on my Tony made a selfish decision to stay in the car. One that cost her her life. Tony was a mother and a great daughter. Excuse me, guys. Sorry. It's just sad and it's a disgrace that these two are allowed to keep their jobs after being found guilty by the department to do failure to do, to do police action 
and failure to probably investigate while responding to a call. As a result of the negligence, my daughter was murdered, her husband, while her daughter watched. The selfish decision they left my daughter, my granddaughter traumatized without a mother, a family that's broken, and a woman's life that was lost forever. As officers, you make an oath to protect and serve. However, however, my daughter was not protected. Those officers failed to do. Oh God, I just can't, guys. I'm so sorry. Ms. Rivera, thank you. I know how difficult this is. Um, I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I'm trying to finish, but it's like, oof. <sighs> they have sent the message that Tony's life did not matter that Tony pleaded for help and wasn't enough action, that women suffering from domestic violence cannot rely on the ones that they're supposed to protect us. You have made this message very clear that our lives and our, are not worthy. And it's okay, it's not okay. And we would not stop until justice is served. I'm so sorry, yes. I tried, I tried my best. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Rivera. Thank you for being here this morning. Um... Thank you. And I'm so sorry. I try to do my best, but it's like, oh gosh, like my emotions is taking over. Understood. Understood. I think my my only question for you is: Has anyone at NYPD ever expressed any remorse? No remorse. Even even after even after she was, um, we have heard about the tragedy. We went to the prison. It's like basically all the officers turned their backs. Nobody was sympathetic. Nobody came out and you know, you know, say the condolences to us. Like I never seen a a priest is so cold, so cold, to be honest. Like not one officer said, you know, said nothing to us. It's just, you know, as a display, so like you said, it's a slap in the face. This is how I'm seeing it. So we gotta do better. Accept uh, my deepest condolences. Thank you and, so much. And heartfelt blessings for healing for your family. Thank you. you and your precious granddaughter. Thank you so much for your testimony this morning. Thank you so much for having me guys. And I'm sorry for breaking down. I, I try to do my best, but it's like, like I said, my emotions took over. You did just fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we've also been joined by council member Brannon. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, committee council at this time. Thank you, Chair. Um, next, we will hear from representatives of the administration. The panelists to uh, give testimony will be uh, the Chief Strategy Officer for the Office of First Deputy Mayor, Chelsea Davis, Chief of Staff for the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Marco Soler, Chief of Patrol for the New York City Police Department, Juanita Holmes, Executive Director for Strategic Initiatives for the New York City Police Department, Elizabeth Dates, Assistant Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters for the New York City Police Department, Oleg Chernovsky, Managing Attorney of the Legislative Affairs Unit for the New York City Police Department, Michael Clark. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath to all members of the administration who will be offering testimony or will be available for questions. Please raise your right hands. I will read the oath uh, in the order that I just read your names, then call on you each individually for a response. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? Um, Chelsea Davis. Yes, I do. Marco Soler. Yes, I do. Uh, Chief Juanita Holmes. I do. Elizabeth Dates. I do. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Chernovsky. I do. And Michael Clark. I do. Thank you. Now I invite uh, Davis, uh, I'm sorry, representatives of the first Deputy Mayor's Office to begin their testimony. Good morning, Chair Adams, members of the Public Safety Committee. Uh, my name is Chelsea Davis. I am the Chief Strategy Officer in the Office of the First Deputy Mayor. I'm joined by Marco Soler from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, um, as well as colleagues from the New York City Police Department, including Juanita Holmes, Chief of Patrol, Oleg Chernovsky, Assistant Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters, Elizabeth Dates, Executive Director of Strategic Initiatives, and Michael Clark, Managing Attorney of the Legislative Affairs Unit. Thank you for inviting us uh, today to discuss this topic. Creating a shared vision of public safety and rebuilding mutual trust between police and the people they serve requires substantial outreach and engagement. 
While a preliminary plan is required by Executive Order 203 will be released in the coming days, we know that one plan alone will not address long-standing concerns raised by communities that have historically borne the brunt of over-policing. We must and we will continue to seek public input and work to ensure that policing reflects the needs of communities long past the April 1st deadline to submit this report plan. We understand that police must earn their legitimacy in the eyes of those that they serve. Solidifying and strengthening new reform, new forms of engagement is central to how we created this plan. It's a central aspect of the plan moving forward. The mayor has already announced some reforms, um, including for the first time ever, giving communities a voice in choosing their precinct commanders. We will empower panels of residents to interview the department's proposed candidates for commander in their local precinct. These panels will advise on the best person to serve them and produce annual performance reviews of the precinct commander, holding commanders accountable to the community. Advocates, communities, and NYPD members themselves spoke about their strong desire for officers to do a better job understanding the culture of the communities they serve. In response, we announced that this spring we will expand the People's Police Academy, a community-led training program for local precinct personnel. In addition, whenever an officer starts working in a new precinct, they will undergo an intensive course, including field training, meeting with community leaders, service providers, small businesses, and youth organizers. Embedding community engagement into training will help ensure that residents have a voice in determining what public safety means to them and looks like in their neighborhood. It's vital that we create a community-wide response to one of our most serious public safety challenges, gun violence. We will launch the New York City Joint Force to End Gun Violence, which will be comprised of NYPD members, cure violence groups, district attorneys, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, other city agencies, and community-based organizations. This group will focus on the small number of people who drive most of the gun violence in our city by concentrating on the 100 blocks that have the highest numbers of shootings, as well as disproportionate numbers of 311 and 911 calls. Community stakeholders and advocates have emphasized the, the pressing need for greater police accountability. The Dinkins plan is a core component of our efforts and will significantly increase accountability by expanding the oversight and investigative authority of the Civilian Complaint Review Board, CCRB. The Dinkins plan expands the information the CCRB can access and the range of issues it can investigate. The Dinkins Plan also establishes the Patrol Guide Review Committee, which will use lessons learned from individual cases to drive policy reforms. In the single largest structural change since CCRB was formed, the Dinkins Plan will also consolidate the Commission to Combat Police Corruption and the Office of the Inspector General of the NYPD with the CCRB. This historic reform will allow the CCRB um, to in initiate investigations and will grant timely access to, to body-worn camera footage, as well as full access to officers' disciplinary and employment histories for substantiated cases. The plan will also give a, a CCRB the authority to investigate individual instances of alleged bias-based policing misconduct. With expanded access to information and combined authority, the newly strengthened CCRB can uh, do, do more to effectively hold officers accountable um, and, and improve public trust. Um, we, we've also heard a lot about the need for further transparency and accountability in the disciplinary process, both from members um, of the community and members of service. So we understand the need for this reform. The administration with council's help has made great strides in improving the disciplinary system, including the publication of the disciplinary matrix and the subsequent um, memorandum of understanding between the NYPD and the CCRB. The matrix has been finalized um, and is posted online. The matrix is the culmination of more than two years of work, which required collaboration between the department, CCRB, and numerous um, advocacy organizations and community stakeholders. To give you a sense of scope, uh, the NYPD received 560 comments on the preliminary draft of the matrix from advocacy organizations, community-based organizations, clergy, oversight entities, members of the public um, on its preliminary draft. We took all of that in and worked to find the right balance. And we believe that the matrix is fair, transparent, and applies um, appropriate penalties to a wide range of misconduct. Um, however, it's also a living document that can be amended if necessary. Uh, the MOU takes this matrix a step further. It's an agreement that applies the matrix to all CCRB discipline cases and confirms that NYPD and CCRB will use the penalty guidelines to determine penalties for officer misconduct. Um, 
It is only under extraordinary circumstances that NYPD or CCRB can depart from the matrix. And if they do, they must provide a publicly available justification. Um, in addition, should the NYPD deviate from CCRB's disciplinary recommendation, it must provide a publicly available justification for doing so. This will allow uh, the council and members of the public to judge how fair the process is and whether appropriate punishment is being meted out. The agreement also empowers the CCRB uh, by ensuring access to NYPD employment history in any case where CCRB investigator recommends that an allegation of misconduct be substantiated. The agreement also outlines that there will be an annual review starting in August 2021 of whether the agreement is accomplishing the mutual goal of consistent and fair discipline. I also want to note again, of course, that the matrix is not set in stone. We're continued to reviewing the matrix with partners and updating it as necessary. To conclude, I want to talk about the bills before us today. Introduction 1671 requires the, the police department to submit quarterly reports on all traffic encounters, including demographic information for those uh, pulled over or stopped at checkpoints. The administration supports um, the goals of this legislation and thinks further transparency into who is stopped and where the stop occurs is important. Um, collecting some data may require coordination with the state, um, but we look forward to these continued conversations with the council. Intro uh, 2220 would create a new local civil right, providing protections against unreasonable search and seizure and create a private right of civil action for violations. It specifies that qualified immunity cannot be used as a defense and any violator would be personally liable for the lesser of $25,000 or 5% of the final judgment. If that sum cannot be collected from the violator, the city would be required to pay. This bill seeks to address two perceived issues, um, that plaintiffs can't receive compensation when they suffer real harms, and that officers are protected from paying out of pocket. Um, however, existing law already affords plaintiffs just compensation. Um, in addition, officers who violate law and policy must pay out of pocket for their defense, um, settlements, and judgments based on New York state law. The bill creates a strict liability offense, even for officers acting in good faith. So an officer uh, who follows the patrol guide could be found personally liable for up to $25,000 if the patrol guide is later found to be incorrect. Uh, this creates uncertainty for members of service and makes it difficult for them to effectively do their jobs and the administration opposes this legislation. Intro 2209 would require the advice and consent of the council for any new police commissioner. The administration opposes this piece of legislation. The council already has oversight over the department. We do not think that creating an additional political process for installing a new commissioner will enhance that oversight. Um, the police commissioner should report to the mayor as chief executive of the city. Um, I wanna thank the chair and the members of committee for inviting me to testify. Um, we want to continue the conversation with the council on these proposals as we move along in the reform process. And I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you again, um, Ms. Davis, for being here with us. Um, you're with us and we really appreciate you and the work that you do, of course. Um, before I get into questions about the bill though, I just really want to acknowledge that once again, we are not joined by Commissioner Shea. Um, he didn't come to our hearing after the protests or our hearing in December on racism in the police department or our hearing last month on police reform. <laughs> so if he's not going to come to testify on legislation that directly impacts the commissioner, their disciplinary authority and how they're appointed, am I correct in assuming that he doesn't plan to show up unless it's a budget hearing? I will let the police department speak to the commissioner's plans, but since we are here to talk about um, these bills and the the mayor's um, reform plan and carrying out executive order uh, 203 um, and generally um, improving public safety and policing. Um, the mayor's office is um, leading this effort. And so that's why I'm here leading testimony today. Okay, fair enough. Wanted to get that on the record that uh, once again, we are missing the commissioner uh, for another very important hearing specifically on police reform. Okay. So advice and consent, this is something that I'm sponsoring, this legislation on advice and consent. It's not a new concept. Right now, confirmation by the city council is required for the head of DOI, for the corporation council, and for the members of nine different policymaking bodies, including the city planning commission, TLC, and the board of health. 
Does the mayor believe that his hands are tied when it came to those positions? Was the city harmed in any way because those nominees were required to come before the council for a vote? So I'll, I'll thank you for that question. Um, I'll start by saying that we, of course, agree that improving accountability is key to reform. Um, it's key to building confidence amongst the public and members of service. Um, we don't think that advising consent would meaningfully improve accountability because um, the council already has oversight over the department. Um, we don't think that this additional political process for installing a new commissioner would enhance that oversight. Um, and the police commissioner should report to the mayor. Um, in terms of um, corporation council and, and DOI and some of the other commissions that you mentioned, um, the Corporation Council represents the city, including the city council, so we think it, it makes sense for that position to have additional layers of approval. Um, in terms of some of the other commissions that you named, there are members that are appointed by council, um, and so, uh, and, and as for DOI, that's, you know, an independent agency, so it's important to have an additional layer of approval there as well. Um, we think the police commissioner should report to the mayor. Um, as chief executive of the city and that um, this process wouldn't wouldn't really add any additional accountability. So you see absolutely zero value in having the seal of approval from the council in, in actually having a commissioner that not only has your support, but has the support of other elected officials in the city. We certainly understand that having trust, confidence, legitimacy of the police commissioner is important for the council and certainly for the public as well as all the members of service. Um, we don't think that advising consent is the most meaningful way to improve that accountability or that confidence. In 2019, did the mayor's appointees to the Charter Revision Commission support requiring advice and consent of the Corporation Council? I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know if um, Marcos or anyone at the police department knows. I can get back to you with that answer. Does anyone on the NYPD side know the answer to that? In 2019, did the mayor's appointees to the Charter Revision Commission support requiring advice and consent of the Corporation Council? No? I'm aware. We can certainly look into it and, and get back to you. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll let you know. Okay, so Ms. Davis, if this bill uh, does pass the council, it would still need to go before the voters in November before it takes effect. So I'm still curious as to what the harm would be in letting the public weigh in on this. I think it's important that we focus on some of the, you know, as part of this plan on some things that we think will have a really genuinely big impact on improving accountability. Um, I don't know if I can speak to the specific harms of this, but we don't think that this would meaningfully improve accountability in the way it's intended. Um, and we think that the, the police commissioner should report to the mayor um, and that the other positions where there's a confirmation or advising consent process um, are different kinds of roles. Uh, I think I'm gonna turn to the uh, NYPD for this uh, particular question that I have in mind. It has to do with, with um, my bill on vehicle stops. Studies have shown that nationally, black drivers are more likely to be targeted in traffic stops. Do you think that the data would show that in New York City, this is any different? So good, good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, good Chair, morning. How are you? Uh, good. First, I'd like to publicly, if you don't mind, um, apologize to Ms. Rivera for what she had to uh, go through. I could not imagine a more traumatic ordeal than losing a child. And, you know, I returned to the department December 31st, uh, 2020. And, um, and I formerly was the chief of domestic violence. And uh, it, was, it was, I can honestly say dear to my heart, I was very passionate about it. So the mere thought that no one uh, apologetically responded to Ms. Rivera, it's, it's mind boggling. But I just wanted to start, uh, start with that. Uh, chief but, Holmes, what do you think about the punishment that was not administered for that crime? Well, I know now the punishment is different. I think what was in place now has been um, expanded upon. And in addition to that, uh, you know, the, the failure uh, to what they were charged with, the failure to properly respond, the failure to properly investigate, now has been, uh, the penalty has increased. In addition to that, any aggravating factors 
will be looked at with a different eye. So I I'm, I'm I can sit here and say wholeheartedly I'm happy to see that that's uh, in place now as far as the nature as far as discipline. I don't have the particular full nature of the crime. Uh, like I said, I was in here and it first came to my attention last week, as a matter of fact, I guess when the penalties were substantiated. Uh, but I know moving along in the future, uh, you will see full transparency and then, and there'll be a difference, uh, I think, uh, as far as penalties are concerned. Uh, but with that, speaking about the traffic stats, Currently now, as it stands, the moving summonses do not capture race. They capture actually what's on the driver's license, uh, which is date of birth, uh, gender, name, things of that nature. But uh, I don't see a problem with us reporting on that. In order to achieve that, I do think maybe like we did with the criminal court summonses, how we have to go back and have to risk at it. It's probably something that we would have to do with the state. Um, other than that, we would be probably led to creating some sort of form, then training, then another database, which is uh, something, I don't know if that's something we want to do, especially when it's capturing race and gender. But we do have stats, specific stats when it comes to enforcement that we can report to, but it's really gender-based, uh, precinct-based, you know, area-based, sector-based, but really doesn't capture race as it stands now. Do you think that uh, legislation like this is going to uh, benefit the NYPD? I think it, I think it does. It will benefit the NYPD. And I, I'd also like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Deutsch. Um, I think I'm going to go to my colleagues at this time. I'm going to come back uh, for another round, though. Thank you, so, Council. First up, we're going to turn to the sponsors of the legislation. I see Councilmember Levin um, is the sponsor that's currently here. Councilmember Levin, would you like to begin? Thank you very much, um, Committee, Committee Council. Um, um, so I want to thank um, uh, members of the administration for testifying. Um, uh, I guess my, my first question would be um, around um, uh, police discipline. Um, and this could go for, for any member of the administration. So the New York Times um, reported um, late last year that there are, um, in instances of serious misconduct um, um, involving the CCRB, that the police commissioner um, diverts from the recommended sanctions 71% of the time. Uh, so, so seven times out of 10, um, the process at CCRB, or I imagine also in, in, in administrative trials, goes forward with an investigation, a prosecution, sometimes even a, um, uh, a, a settlement, although I, I understand that this, is, that, that this issue was addressed in this MOU, but 71% of the time that happens. That's status quo. That's status quo. Why, why does the police commissioner need to retain final disciplinary authority in light of that fact? Um, I want to thank you for, for bringing this up, especially this issue of concurrence. Um, I'll speak to that and then I'll, I'll come back to the question of um, final disciplinary authority, um, because I think, you know, concurrence between um, CCRB and NYPD um, in terms of convictions and penalties is extremely important for public trust and confidence in the oversight um, system, which is necessary um, for, for accountability. And so um, that is a, you know, that lack of concurrence is a major issue um, that this administration has been working to address. Um, and, and, you know, something that's we're really focusing on in this reform plan, um, both the commissioner, the police commissioner and the chair of CCRB have firmly committed to sticking to the disciplinary matrix, um, which is designed exactly to address the, the issues that you're talking about. Um, so any and all deviations from the matrix, which should be extremely rare, will be made public, um, including an explanation directly from the police commissioner 
as to the basis for that um, deviation. All changes to the matrix itself will be made public. Um, there'll be no question that the council and the public will be able to continually examine it here um, and review it. If, 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 if I may, to, to interrupt, I'm sorry, that, but if it's, if it's so, supposed to be uh, extremely rare, as you say, um, I mean, there's a big difference between extremely rare and 71%. That's a world apart. Those are, that's, that's a, that is a, um, that's not even on the same planet. And, and so I, you know, just, yeah. just, a, the, the, an M, you know, you can forgive, I imagine the skepticism that an MOU, an MOU, which is non-legally binding, that can be dissolved at any time or amended at any time, unilaterally, um, you know, by the administration, dissol essentially dissolves at the end of this, this year with a new administration. Um, I just don't understand what's the argument against mm -hmm. saying, why not have an independent body have final disciplinary authority? Why should it remain? What's the affirmative case for it remaining with the commissioner as opposed to an independent body? Why does the commissioner need that authority? Why does the commissioner even want that authority? So, if I, so I, I, wanna, I wanna answer this question, but I first wanna clarify that the, the statistics that you're citing are from before this matrix was put into effect. And we agree that this is a huge concern, which is you know why we worked with council to- But, a matri but the matrix uh, doesn't actually, concerns. the matrix itself does not, does not mm -hmm. address concurrence. It's the matrix, the, the, the CCRB could recommend one um, discipline within the matrix and, and the commissioner could, could divert from within the matrix. So the matrix is good. The matrix, it was our idea. We passed legislation to make you do the matrix. Sorry, but it's, it's, it's not, wasn't the administration's, the administration didn't do it on their own. They did it as per legislation. So, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that, I'm, I'm gonna describe a little bit more for, for clarity what the, the MOU does in relation to the matrix. And then I'll answer your question about, um, ultimate discretion. So I want to be clear that we agree that this concern about concurrence is extremely important. And that's, you know, why we are also looking forward to, you know, from now on utilizing this matrix. Um, NYPD and CCRB signed this MOU, which is like a written legal agreement um, regarding the implementation of the matrix. It applies to all CCRB discipline cases. I'm inspired. They will use the guidelines. Um, to determine penalties for misconduct and that only under extraordinary circumstances can they they depart if so um if there is a departure from the matrix or if there's I, a departure I, from Chelsea, the i know you, you said this in your testimony i know i got it you said it in your testimony i understand that it's gonna it's gonna have a public letter a public face letter i get all that why affirmatively does the does the police commissioner need this authority why does he want this authority and why should it not be with an independent body Frankly, I don't even know, know if it has to be with the CCRB. It could be with an independent body, a truly independent body. Why? Why? What's the problem with that? So I, I do think that there's kind of a natural inclination to look to the top when we're looking to implement reform. We want to do that in every area, but not all problems related to discipline are, are a function of the, the police commissioner. So we need to focus on consistency, transparency, just and fair penalties throughout the whole the whole process. Um, the, I, I don't want to talk about it in, in more detail, but the, the matrix and the MOU are really huge steps in that direction. Um, and why, why have they diverted 71% of the time? I mean, past this prologue, you know, so it's, it's great to hear that there's this the matrix that we made you guys do last year with legislation. So I, I get that, but why, why is, why is there a diversion rate of 71%? Because you're extremely rare, I would think that that's like two, three percent, not seventy-one percent. And and that's absolutely the goal, and that's why the MOU. But why? Why is it? Why has it been at seventy-one percent? So, council member, if I if, let me jump in here. So, a couple of points. One is when you talk about the divergence rate and the consistency rate, that does fluctuate. I know you're gravitating towards the seventy-one, but that's not a comprehensive seventy-one. It doesn't mean it's based on the, the charges, right? So the police commissioner can agree on certain charges in a case and could disagree on another charge in a case. What the discipline matrix does is uses historic penalties 
opened it up for public comment. We worked with Councilman Member Donovan Richards, who introduced the bill. This bill, he raised the issue with the blue ribbon panel that we impaneled to take a look at our uh, discipline process. Then you ultimately codified the idea that Council Member Richards discussed during the blue ribbon panel um, a review of our discipline process, okay? We designed a discipline matrix with the input of the public, with the input of all of the stakeholders. What it creates is a range of penalties with aggravating and mitigating factors and the divergence on any particular charge is therefore gonna be minimized if not pretty much eliminated in almost all cases. Now, when you talk about- But why has it happened, Oleg? I, and you know I respect you, but why has it been, why, sorry, there's two questions that you guys haven't answered yet. First off, why, why was wasn't it 71%? Second answer. question is, I, I appreciate it, but why, why should the police commissioner retain this authority? Why? What's the affirmative- okay, Council member, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the, the last question and then we can go back to PD for, to talk more about concurrence. Um, I, I want to stress that we understand kind of what a big ticket item this is and how important it is. Um, however, the, the impact of moving final decision making is, isn't clear. And because of some of the potential unintended consequences, we need like to what? be extremely thoughtful. Like what are, the un, what, are, what are the potential unintended consequences? I'm, I'm getting to it. So, okay. so firstly, changing the process through state law now could open up the, this major reform to collective bargaining negotiations and new litigation. Let, let, um, let me hold, let me, let me know, interject. Let, let, sorry, 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 let me interject there because state law is state law is would in in in, in effect um, uh, could preclude a collective bargaining. The, the collective bargaining is is under collective bargaining is assured under existing. Uh, for, for public employees is as per state law. If new state law precludes collective bargaining in police to put in police discipline cases, which is the status quo right now under 14115, there's no collective bargaining under for police disciplinary cases. If the state law changes it itself, that's it's a, it's a that's a red herring. That's a red herring. I haven't heard a single serious argument that that the state is, does not retain the authority under state legislation, or even honestly, if they could grant the city the, legis the that authority through state legislation, that 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 that, that collective bargaining um, uh, is then triggered. Because again, status quo under fourteen one fifteen for the last eighty three years has been that collective bargaining is not triggered. So the state, the state and the city have had could retain the same right that they've had. For the last 83 years to not have collective bargaining when it comes to police discipline. Before we get into that, I'm, I'm going to finish the rest of the answer to your question. Um, I, I want to make sure that it's, it's clear that other jurisdictions have, have lots of different kinds of, of models for final discipline with um, final decision making power located outside of the police commissioner and also have really major problems with accountability and discipline. Um, and so we think that the actual next best step is moving forward with implementation of this matrix and the MOU, as well as all of the oversight reforms laid out in the Dinkins plan. But they're, not mutually and that's but they're not mutually exclusive. They don't, the one, one doesn't, moving the disciplinary, final disciplinary authority away from the police commissioner doesn't prevent the matrix from moving forward. And it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, like what's the harm? Explain the harm other than this nebulous potential collective bargaining that we don't think is actually a real issue. Aside from that, what, what, what's the harm? There really is no perfect model and other jurisdictions that have this different kind of authority still have really, really big problems. And so we're saying that we're perfect. No, I'm not saying that we're perfect. We strive towards perfection. We don't, we're never, we never attain it. We never attain it. We're fallible. But 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 what I don't understand what is the downside? What is the downside other than this than this uh, uh, kind of straw man argument about collective bargaining? Council member, make if, I, if I if I may chime in, chime back in, um, what you have is a system that's set up now that has input from an independent body, which is CCRB, that does an investigation of a complaint that makes recommendations based on board members that are appointed by the council, the mayor, and the public advocate. Yeah. Recommendations. The
The recommendations ultimately will go to the police commissioner inside of the department that has experience in policing and evaluates those recommendations. Those recommendations have been, I would say, fine tuned now through a matrix that basically should bring all of us into alignment. But ultimately, it's the agency head having control over the personnel in their organization, which every organization effectively has. I mean, I'm not necessarily sure of any example where your personnel and your staff is the, the, the removal or the disciplining of your staff is dictated by somebody else. For example, even in the city council, you don't outsource the discipline of council members to an outside body. You do it in-house through your ethics committee, correct? Is that- That's true, correct? yeah. Yeah. Right. Would you be- Okay, prepared? fine. I, 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 I'm, not sure, I'm not sure it's quite analogous. Um, can I ask Council you? member, I think police wait, commissioner wait, 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 authority I, 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 means just, that police commissioner um, authority means that the police commissioner is is accountable, and we think that the matrix, the MOU, and police accountable commissioner to whom? are the best ways to improve this. Account of, accountable to whom? Accountable to the mayor? Not certainly not to the council. We can't fire him. We can't even question him, frankly. So we haven't questioned him since June. Um, anyway, uh, I, I, it's it, it, it the, the need to me. I, I mean. I, 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 again, I, I, I've worked with both of you for a long time. I respect both of you. It seems it is, it is, I've seen no argument for why they, the, I just haven't heard an argument about why affirmatively, except for what you said, Oleg, about keeping, um, you know, discipline within, um, you know, having the discretion to, to discipline members. And I don't think anyone's saying that the police commissioner can't discipline members, but having the final authority to divert from the findings of a CCRB investigative body or an administrative trial judge, which they, they, they I mean, it's not like the, the mayor's been the mayor for seven years and one and a month and a half. So, uh, you know, that's a long time. So, so to say that the discipline that, oh, this is this, this uh, problem we've been addressing. You haven't been addressing it. 71% is, 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 is not, is not, uh, you know, that's the vast majority. It's over two thirds of the time. So, so anyway, without the context that we talked about, I don't think is right. But the other point that should be recognized is the difference that happened over the last, I would say, year and a half is 50A was repealed, right? Now, with the end of this litigation, that's probably going to be upon us soon. There's going to be a lot of transparency into the discipline. But that, what, what does that have to do with the disciplinary authority? It has That's, nothing to do with the disciplinary excuse authority. Me, excuse me. It would give transparency into the process that didn't exist for decades and decades. Two, there's been a matrix put forward with public input that gives everybody, both police officers and the public, insight into how the disciplinary process works, not only the outcome. So now there are presumptive penalties. We know what the aggravating and mitigating factors are. The public knows what they are. These are groundbreaking, massive changes to a process that's existed the same way for decades. What you're saying is, let's not wait to see how all of this is going to work. Because you're saying yourself that it is us that passed this discipline matrix law, right? But you're not waiting to see if this works. You just want to go and abandon it and throw it aside and say- I'm out of here in, I, in, in I 11 months. I'm out of here in less than 11 months. I, I we, We've been waiting seven oh, years. We don't- Oh, here it, we it, are. It, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, that's not, it, 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 there's, I don't see any other than a theoretical um, uh, control of the agency by, you know, within the chain of command argument, I don't see an argument against it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass, I, I know my colleagues have questions and I'll, so I'll come back on the second round, I think, if that's okay. Thank you, Council Member Levin. Uh, next up is gonna be Council Member Rosenthal followed by Council Member Holden. Time starts now. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much um, uh, for this hearing, Chair Adams, really appreciate that. And um, I really wanna also say to Ms. Rivera that my heart goes out to you. Um, uh, there are no words, but 
absolutely deserve every ounce of respect for what you're doing, for what you've been through, what you've had to handle. So um, you're a very brave, very strong woman. And I'm really impressed. Thank you. Um, I want to ask a different set of questions that really go to the heart of what happened to Tony Wells. Um, and that is talking about the um, crime victim um, treatment CVAPs that were at the uh, precinct itself. And I'm curious to know if the CVAPs were involved at all around uh, Ms. Wells' case. Um, I appreciate that you bringing this up. Um, the Crime Victim Assistance Program um, is certainly something that's extremely important that we're always looking to, to um, improve and, and make sure that um, we can work with community organizations um, and, and give people services. Um, I'll let PD speak to this specific case. So um, I can't speak specifically because I really don't have that information whether or not they were involved. Uh, should they have been? Absolutely. Um, all victims of crimes, including the surviving victims uh, like Ms. Rivera, should have been contacted and services offered. But I apologize, I can't get that information but I currently today, as it stands, don't have that time. I mean, what's heartbreaking is that you wouldn't think to ask that question yourself. I apologize for not asking that question, but that, I need the information. I mean, with, all, with all due respect and knowing that you're new to this job, so I really am not holding you personally accountable, but it's- You can, because I'm not new to the department. I've been here 30 somewhat years, but like I spoke earlier to Madam Chair, I was recently briefed on this as, re you know, as recent as Friday. I was not aware of it and I apologize. I was not here for a year. So even when I heard about it, it was surprising to me, but I will have that information. And uh, no, I'm accountants and I'm accountable, I'm responsible. It, I know the job. I know you. The Thank job. you very much. I and you, I can't tell you how much I respect you. And I'm interrupting only because I'm on a clock so it's, it's no disrespect meant, Chief. Um, and honestly, uh, thank goodness for you. I hope you stay. I hope you continue to get a warm welcome from uh, Commissioner Shea. And I hope to see more people who have the dedication just like you in the top level positions. You're the breath, you are the breath of fresh air. So um, what I'm getting to, given the fact that no one around the table, even the people who were briefed, never thought to ask this question, never got the answer, it really goes to the heart of independent review, independent investigations. And I say this not only because it wasn't your first question, which is the question of what has been our trauma-informed response and how are we serving any survivors, which by the way, that is the point of the Crime Victim Assistance Program the CVAPs, you have two in every precinct and their job is to do exactly that. Um, it speaks to why there has to be independent investigations, independent of the police department. My time is running up, but I'm gonna just remind everyone that I say this based on the 2018 DOI report where there was uh, honest, thank you, if I could just finish chair half a minute, where there was an honest review with honest information that has to this day, even with legislation passed, been fundamentally 
disregarded. So if the Special Victims Division, whose job it is to deal with sexual assaults, does not operate from a position of trauma-informed investigations, boy, are we in trouble. Because we had this hearing two years ago. It's not a, it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Um, but the training still isn't happening. And, you know, I will reach out to Chair Adams separately about possibility of a hearing about the Special Victims Division. I don't mean to distract from this one, but the point being that you can't fix it if it's not independent and if you don't have buy-in from the NYPD, which is why Chair Adams is asking for the commissioner to be engaged in these hearings. Thank you much, very much, Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. Just, just to you. respond, I, I really want to thank you for those comments. Um, and just broadly, I want to um, reiterate that um, we have been really working really closely with PD, um, you know, in general and as part of this reform process with the Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence um, to make sure that their community partners, um, that the people they work with in the community um, are, are involved um, and that we're hearing their voices. Um, and I also want to reiterate, um, our, our agreement and support that external independent oversight is, is extremely important. Um, and, and that's why um, we've you know, announced the, the Dinkins plan as well as um, implementing the DOI's recommendation to consolidate oversight, which we think will have a really large role in improving accountability. Uh, I'm gonna let Councilmember Rosenthal throw in here one more time. And uh, I'm also going to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Gibson. Last point, but every single day there are attacks on women and I have never heard out of the mayor's mouth, let alone the commissioner's mouth, that we need to take trauma-informed, uh, we need to have trauma-informed solutions. We're sending out a letter today to the mayor in response to the fact that in the Victor Rivera case, where he sexually, we came to light last week that he sexually assaulted 10 women. We have not heard a peep out of the mayor's mouth about reaching out to the victims and asking them what they need and connecting them to survivor groups. This is why we have a problem. You can't say we've been working on the matrix, we're working with the office to end domestic and gender-based violence and say, oh my gosh, there's a crisis. Let's do two things. One, shift back to the board of directors for them to fix it in the Brown's housing network case and ask for an independent audit of how we procure contracts. Not a peep about what this administration does for the victims. Not even saying the phone number, the city funded phone number of the sexual assault hotline. Why does it not cross the administration's mind to think about the victims? There's no excuse. Um, and we'll follow up on this letter later. I appreciate you, Chair, for giving me a second go round. Absolutely. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Council? Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Next, we'll turn to Councilmember Holden. Before we do, I just want to remind members of the public uh, not to use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, you will be called after uh, the administration's testimony and questioning uh, has completed. Um, we'll turn to Councilmember Holden now, followed by Councilmember Powers. I'm sorry, Smile. Thank you so much, uh, Chair, for this important hearing. Uh, I just wanted to, I guess this is for NYPD, but the mayor's office can weigh in. 
Uh, let's talk about qualified immunity for a second. Under intro 2220, qualified immunity is eliminated. Uh, qualified immunity only comes into play where there is not a clear statute or a constitutional right. So what evidence has been presented that qualified immunity is being used incorrectly? And how many times is it used? Uh, thank you, council member, for that question. My name is Liz Dates. I'm the executive director of strategic initiatives for the New York City Police Department. I previously served as executive director of civil litigation in the department's legal bureau, and I've spent my career uh, litigating issues related to qualified immunity. I can provide some data regarding the um, use of qualified immunity in New York State um, under a Reuters study qualified immunity defenses were raised in the Second Circuit in uh, raised and granted in the Second Circuit on 25 total appeals between 2005 and 2019, which is less than two cases per year. I could also say that under a study done by Joanna Schwartz at Yale University, she examined 1,183 28 USC 1983 cases brought in federal court involving police action uh, only 38 or 3.9% of those cases were dismissed because of the qualified immunity defense at summary judgment or on a motion to dismiss. So qualified immunity is a defense that has very limited applicability on a limited number of federal claims brought in federal court. So it's, it's not really, it, it's not a huge issue. Uh, so, and this is what I'm, I don't, I don't understand this, this, the whole concept of trying to um, punish officers who are, who think they're doing their job. So that th these are the concerns I have. So uh, I'll ask NYPD, what concerns do you have that this policy will only accelerate retirements? Uh, considering, you know, also considering the number of retirements we had in 2020. I, I think council member, you know, I'll, I'll say it this way, that it's, this bill is a very huge issue for its impact on public safety and our ability to recruit and train police officers. So imagine that the way this bill is written, and I know Council Member Levin used Colorado as a, as a model. Mind you, Colorado's state laws are different than New York state laws. So the gaps that they were filling are not necessarily the gaps that we had here. But what this bill would do is would create a $25,000 liability, personal liability, not only for the police officer, but for every police officer at the scene that failed to intervene when the police officer acted in accordance with the law. So how in the world do you train your police force to do their job? You're clearly training them to follow the law. But what this bill would do would be penalizing them personally for following the law, right? And I mean, just to, to counter one point, I know during the opening statement, Council Member Levin mentioned that if an all, it creates accountability for egregious misconduct. Well, if there's egregious misconduct under current law in New York City and New York State, a police officer would not be indemnified a police officer could be held liable and would not be represented by the law department, would have to represent themselves. And then another point that was made during the opening is for officers that act reasonably, they're not covered by the bill. So I'm going to read you the language of the bill. It is not a defense to liability that a police officer, a covered individual, has any kind of immunity for discretionary acts involving the exercise of reasoned judgment taken during the performance of their duties. It is also not a defense to liability pursuant to this bill that, that the officer was acting in good faith or believed reasonably or otherwise that the conduct of such individual was lawful at the time it was committed. And I'll make a good point, but if I can add on to it as a comparison to the Colorado bill, the Colorado bill has similar uh, levels of liability, but officers are indemnified by the state or locality if they're acting in reasonable and in good faith that they're following the law, which is not the case in this bill. 
Um, so it, it's more harsh than what Colorado has done. And as Oleg said, Colorado is dealing with a much different situation where they their state has not I'm waived sovereign immunity like ours has. In addition, they had caps on the total payouts that we don't have here, a $900,000 cap, even in the limited circumstances where you could sue a police officer in Colorado. So they were dealing with a much different issue when they passed their law than what we're dealing with here. I mean, the, the in short, I mean, the public safety impact of this bill is really immeasurable. But I think the best example I can give you is we had about 1,860 shooting victims last year. That was a 102% increase over the year before. Under this bill, if it's enacted, if a police officer arrests an individual that's in possession of an illegal gun and that gun gets suppressed, that officer could be held liable personally for $25,000. And so will every fellow officer at the scene of that gun recovery. So the question is, do we really believe that if this bill passes, officers would be able to stop anybody that they believe is in possession of a gun when they're weighing, do I take a gun off the street and could I afford a $25,000 personal liability hit? Right, a uh, chair, if I may, just um, uh, a quick you know, comment or question. Are there any other classes of employees that are held personally liable for violating a rule that was not clearly established or conduct uh, was in good faith? So th this is what I'm saying. We're singling out officers. They have a very difficult job and we're making it tougher. And we're, it's not going to help the policing of New York City. It's going to make New York City more dangerous. So you know what? There's a point here where we just have to stop and step back a bit and then realize that we have a great police force. And yet, yes, okay, we can come up with some changes and reform and we should, but not just go too far. And we've seen the results of some of our uh, policies already or our changes. So I just think, um, Chair, this is dangerous by, by, obviously we wanna have hearings, we wanna have these things vetted and obviously asked, but what I'm hearing, uh, qualified immunity. There could be 20 officers standing around who don't know what's going on. They're just um, with the whole detail and they could be personally liable and they don't even see what is happening. And this is so, so dangerous. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Holden. We'll now turn to Councilmember Powers, followed by Councilmember Riley. Time starts now. Thank you. Thanks everyone for the testimony. Um, I, I had an opportunity to just hear some of the earlier questions. So I want to just, but I want to go back to um, some, some of the points I think Councilmember Levin was uh, pointing out, but I want to just, just more broad topic here. The, what, what is the harm to moving accountability here? We have multiple systems of accountability, it seems like multiple agencies and, uh, and areas for accountability when it comes to NYPD. You have internal affairs for your department, you have DOI, Inspector General, you have CCRB. What would be the, I just, I wanna hear maybe the feedback on why it would, we, it would not make sense or why, why, should not, why not move or maybe even centralize all that into one accountable place and take it out of the commissioner's hands. Why would, as a New Yorker, a taxpayer, why would you not want your you know, sort of police force to have an independent, independently accountable entity uh, that, uh, you know, that's not politically motivated, that's not uh, maybe less persuaded by, you know, what public opinion, but, you know, provides independent oversight and accountability. Why, can I just hear the, the mayor's office and maybe NYPD just restate what is the harm to, of that? Sure, sure. Um, thank, thank you for asking. Um, I do want to reiterate that we think changing um, this, this authority through state law could open um, the, this major issue to collective bargaining negotiations and, and new litigation. And we do take that concern very seriously, specifically because we have seen in other jurisdictions how having these different models um, doesn't necessarily improve accountability for discipline. Um, this is not an issue that's just a function of the police commissioner, but of the entire process. And, and that's what we wanna be focused on. Okay, um, so, I, so let me just, just for, I'm sorry to interrupt you, just for limited time here. Do you think accountability is going to get worse if you shift it away from the commissioner to an independent, or is that what you're saying? Do you, you think it's gonna get worse? 
I think there's the potential for a lot of unintended consequences, which just means we have to be extremely thoughtful and deliberative about this. And we also have to make sure um, that we actually see whether the reforms that we've put in place, which we think are major steps forward, um, are, are working. Um, I, I think as Oleg said before, um, there is certainly going to be a level of transparency into this process that we have never seen um, that will have really big impacts. Um, you also mentioned um, a lot about general structures of oversight and I would um, like the opportunity to, to have um, Marco Soler from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice speak to how important it's going to be to consolidate um, the oversight entities and, and why we think that also is going to have such a positive impact for accountability. Marcos. Hi. So right now, what we have, as you know well, is a system with three different entities and two, three different things. One investigates, one price basically audits, the other does some monitoring in the police department. We think it's a time to move from individual instances of misconduct to have systemic reviews of the department. I think that is the area where we have done less as an administration, as a city, and the consolidation process that we think is going to be obviously thoughtfully thought about with different partners. It tried to precisely address that issue, how we bring greater levels of accountability than only focus on individual misconduct, but greater areas where we see systemic problems in the department. That is the emphasis on consolidation, and that's going to be the emphasis uh, in bringing greater accountability into this process by having, as you said, a one independent entity that can look across different parts of the department from different perspectives. Okay, look, I just, I'm going to move on to other questions. I think it's just so crystal clear to me that having independent and clear, uh, uh, you know, it, it, entities for oversight and accountability is part of this conversation that we're having right now. Whether wherever you fall on the spectrum of issues here, I, I, it almost feels like universal to me that you should have uh, both more centralized and, and clearer sort of visibility into the process by centralizing some of these discipline authorities, but also it, it, so universal that, and I, I actually do think, I think Ola Grace, I agree this is the city council too, that you should have independent oversight and accountability that should be shifted away from the folks that are operating within that body. I think that applies to all, all of us. Um, I wanna just go to residency for a second. There's a resolution here. Anna, the, 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 I, I know if I heard it, did, did this, the administration have a opinion on the residency requirement that is in proposing a resolution here? Um, I haven't spoken to it yet, but I'm happy to. Um, this is a really important issue. We're certainly still reviewing um, related to, to residency. Um, I wanna make it clear that New York City residency is um, already among a number of factors that's considered in determining the strength of a candidate's application um, for acceptance in the police academy. So in recent years, applicants who are New York City residents um, receive a five point bump in their overall score, um, moving them upwards on the civil service list. Um, and uh, aside from military service, this is the only factor that, that can um, raise a candidate's score in this way. Um, but I also, you know, want to point out that the goal of behind a residency requirement is ensuring that we have a police force that's representative of the communities that it serves. Um, and and our, we want to focus our reform plan on this goal in a much more holistic way than just residency. Um, so making sure that officers are immersed in and educated um, by the communities that they serve, um, taking a, a larger look at recruitment, promotions, initial qualifications, um, you know, up are gonna be a lot more effective than, than just considering residency at achieving that ultimate goal. Okay, so, but it doesn't sound like you have a stated opinion on it or at this point, or is there, uh, uh, you are opposed to it or? Uh, you it's support? certainly something that we're still considering and, and looking at. We've heard from both officers and, and communities, um, you know, a significant desire for members to better understand and represent um, the, the communities that they're serving in. Okay, I'll finish on this question just out of respect for the time here. Um, I just thought we heard, we talked, I heard a, a little bit of dialogue around advice and consent earlier in regard to the bill that would require, I think it's actually a charter, it had to make a charter amendment to, uh, to require advice and consent when it comes to the police commissioner. I heard a little bit of um, discussion about other, but can, maybe you can just clarify for all of us 
your sort of operating theory here on when advice and consent should apply and when it shouldn't? Because I did hear some some talk about, well, we appoint certain members, so that's where advice and consent lies. You don't believe it for this case. So what is the, maybe what is the, the when should it apply? When do you think advice and consent should apply to a commissioner of a city agency? Sure. So I, I can speak to when it has been um, applied and, and why that was appropriate. Um, I think you know DOI is an independent agency, so an additional level of you know approval from council is certainly appropriate. Um, TLC has members um, appointed by the council. Um, Corporation council represents the city, including city council. Um, I, I don't have a full comprehensive list of all the commissions where there's the same process. Um, I'm happy to follow up with, with that. Um, but the police commissioner um, should, should report to the mayor and the, you know, who's accountable to, to all voters and that this, this process for the police department um, would not represent an improvement in meaningful um, accountability, which is you know, what we're focused on in this plan. So let me just say that level for one last. Wouldn't it make more sense to have commissioners like we appoint commissioners to the Taxi Lean Commission? That's our version of like sort of accountability within the agency. Wouldn't it make inverse sense to have an agency where we have no appointments to that agency to be actually the places where we would have advice and consent, being that we have no other method for uh, uh, input on the decision making after after the appointment? I mean, we, we don't think that this would be a meaningful way to improve it, no. but we're also, of course, always open to continue discussions about. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for taking me. Sorry for taking too much time, but I appreciate your consideration. No, you didn't take too much time at all. And you actually brought something back to my council member power. So thank you uh, for that last question. Uh, my question earlier to Ms. Uh, Davis was whether or not the mayor's appointees to the Charter Revision Commission in 2019, whether or not they supported requiring advice and consent of the Corporation Council. And the answer was, um, I don't know. The answer is yes, they did. So I want to make that perfectly clear. Um, it wasn't a loaded question at all, but the, but the answer was yes. In 2019, the mayor's appointees to the Charter Revision Commission supported requiring advice and consent of the Corporation Council. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. And Council, I go back to you for questions. Uh, next up is Councilmember Riley, followed by Councilmember Miller. I'm starting now. Thank you, Chair Adams. And I appreciate the administration for coming today and giving this presentation. Um, I share the same sentiments as the majority of my colleagues with staying that an independent oversight overseer. Uh, will be will do much better with transparency, but I want to go back to Ms. Davis um, to talk about the reform. I didn't hear anything about the peaceful protesting uh, reform that um, the mayor's office and NYPD should be implementing. Um, as we saw last June up till now, there has been uh, suppression where peaceful protesters have been um, violently uh, harassed by NYPD while peaceful, um, peacefully protesting social injustice. So I just want to talk to the reform or is there a plan to address that huge issue? Because as we're seeing, uh, I'm pretty sure after um, this budget and, and, and a lot of these legislations will be passed, we will be seeing a lot more protests. And so is there any reform to address this concern moving forward? Absolutely, and we very much appreciate the reports from both uh, DOI and, and the law department on um, policing protests um, and fully plan to implement all 20 recommendations from DOI and 10 recommendations from the law department. Um, and that includes the recommendation to consolidate oversight, which as we've discussed, um, is the biggest structural change to police oversight um, since CCRB was founded. Um, and, and we think that that will have um, all those, the implementation of, of all those 30 recommendations um, will have a, a really big impact. Okay. My next question is the crime prevention programs within each police district. Um, can you just elaborate more on how NYPD plans on partnering with these crime prevention um, programs to eliminate or de-escalate gun violence within our communities? Sure, I'm gonna ask um, Marcos to, to take that question about, um, I think you're asking about the crisis management system. Yes, correct. Thank you. 
for your question. So first I want to say is, as you know, the administration has been completely committed to the expansion of CMS. And this is not just a expansion of program, this is expansion of philosophy, a philosophy in which we believe that the responsibility of public safety doesn't fall just in the hands of the police department, certainly falls in the hands of the citizens, particularly through this network of violence interrupters. So our idea is to continue that expansion. The, mention, the mayor announced that during uh, this, his address to the city this year, we are going to continue to bring additional resources to double the, uh, the workforce of people dedicated to gun violence. Part of that is obviously to establish new patterns of collaboration with the police department, specifically focus on the anti uh, on the joint force for uh, to the uh, to end gun violence in the city of New York. And we are starting to implement that program. We're starting to work with the police department, with many city agencies, with the DAs, etc., in order to make sure that we can accommodate and bring all those community partners into a very comprehensive plan citywide. Thank you. And last but not least, um, I would like to extend my condolences to Ms. Rivera. Um, what she's went through is very uh, painful. And for her to even come here today to give this testimony um, is very, is very admirable. And I just want to um, inquire, how can we make sure that this does not happen again? Um, I believe what she went through um, was very painful and what she want is answers. And how can we make sure and how does the NYPD make sure that these issues won't be happening again, especially with a person who has been called to uh, a, a residency for domestic violence on countless occasions. How can we make sure that this does not happen again moving forward? I, I really wanna thank you for that, that question. Um, I think absolutely, you know, that, that case highlights the way that we need to think about members of service being held to a higher standard. Um, and, and that through this reform process, we need to fundamentally rethink what, what makes a good police officer and um, what the expecta expectations for that role are and, and how we create accountability on individual level levels and systemic levels to, to respond to, to incidents like that and, and prevent anything like that from happening in the future. Um, we talk about the disciplinary matrix as a living document. One of, one of the reasons is because we can't foresee every incident that can happen. And so we need to make sure that we can go back and make changes as transparently as, as possible. Um, the mayor also announced as part of the Dinkins plan, the um, patrol guide review committee, which will um, make sure that um, incidents that might, um, you know, have been okay, according to current policy and procedure, um, that we can highlight them when the policy and procedure is actually the thing that needs to change um, to, to prevent what's happening in the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Riley. We'll now turn to Councilmember Miller. Time starts now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I apologize for, for missing the, the testimony, and um, which is uh, pivotal to any contributions that I could make. But some of the things that uh, you know that uh, we've discussed uh, internally over the over the past year as it relates to police reform uh, uh, that stands out in particular, uh, the police commission of being the final arbiter of discipline uh, within the department. Um, would, 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 would the administration agrees that, that the, the police commissioner is responsible for upholding the integrity of the department? I, I, I do think it's essential that the police commissioner be held um, accountable um, and, and. No, I, I, is it responsible for upholding the integrity of the, the department? Uh, and, and I would add the image and integrity of the department. Is that, would you say that that was a role of responsibility of the, uh, and a, a task of the police commissioner? Um, I, I certainly agree with that. Um, I also and, and if that is the task and role of the police commissioner, would that be compromised by him uh, uh, implementing discipline to his subordinates in any shape, form, or fashion? Would that uh, in, in sometimes highlight uh, 
things that may compromise the integrity of the police department. And by doing so, would it not be in the best interest to have an independent arbiter to make those decisions? Um, I, sorry, um, I, I, I don't think, um, I, I, I don't think that the best um, way to make the decision is external to the department. I think we have to be sure that consistency and transparency and fair penalties are um, happen throughout the entire discipline process. Um, yeah, that, I get that, but that's not, that wasn't the question that I asked. I said, did that undermine, potentially undermine the integrity of the process by having someone engage, someone who was charged with maintaining the integrity and the image of the department being the sole arbiter? Um, I'm not sure. So that, was the, so that was the question and you could mold that and answer it. But the second part would be, because you mentioned uh, collective bargaining. Um, and, and in my experience, uh, uh, the, the independent arbiters were selected by, uh, during contract negotiations between the union and, 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 and management uh, that they collectively decided on an independent arbiter based on experiences in a particular industry and, and, and uh, other dynamics that would be related that, that folks thought that might make him, not just the, him or her, I, not just qualified arbiter, uh, but one um, that would be fair in, in, on, for both parties. I, I, you know, uh, uh, could you expound on what would be different from that, that, that uh, from, from a labor perspective that would not be permissible because uh, it was kind of eluded that, that collective bargaining would not allow for this and some of the other uh, uh, intros that we're discussing today to happen. Is there a reason why it cannot be done? Because of because you 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 intimated that because of collective bargaining was impossible, I would submit the exact opposite. That it it is a process of terms and conditions of employment. In my experience as a president and a business agent, we selected along with management as part of the collective bargaining process an independent arbiter. What would be different? And, and, and why, we, why of all the industries, of all the agencies, of all the professions, would this be different? Sure. I'm, I'm gonna ask the police department to speak to this question um, because of their expertise over the, the their collective bargaining process. Yeah, so council member, if, if I may, I, look, I think the issue is, and I answered it in response to I think it was council member 11's question that ultimately the goal is to create a process, right? That, is, that is transparent, that has stakeholders both within the department that have significant expertise in policing and could evaluate a police officer's actions through that lens. But equally as important is the external stakeholders that can review <laughs> the case independently and that could offer their insight and their recommendations, give them to the police commissioner who ultimately is in control of the agency. Just like- With all due respect, that hasn't that, happened in the past. Excuse me? In all due respect, that hasn't happened in the past. None of the recommend the majority of the recommendations around discipline from CCRB and others have not been consistent with discipline that had ultimately been dispensed by the police commissioner. Well, I think council member, we're in a different place now. Right, and I think we could all agree on that. You know, we had- and, and This is a process that works for other folks. The question is why wouldn't it work for the police department? And they do, there are other police agencies that certainly law enforcement agencies that use independent arbiters. In fact, the NYPD is an anomaly even in this region in doing so in this manner. Well, you, you're at, you, you were asking for our opinion on, on, this, on this move, removing the what makes, what, what, makes, what, what, what makes us so different from, from other municipalities, other law enforcement agencies, even within this own municipality? Sir, I think 
if I may, I, I think a lot of the jurisdictions around the state and around the country that use an independent arbiter that are selected by um, a combination of, as you said, union and management have come under heavy criticism because those arbitrators predominantly side with the officer and impose substantially less or no discipline than, than what is reflected by the, the will of the community. And the Could, you Could you be specific? Could you be specific? Because um, that's the same situation that we're seeing now with the police commissioner being the final arbiter. That that's kind of arbitrary to throw out there to say that Rochester or Buffalo or Connecticut or somewhere. Like, could you be specific and and and, and I, I mean, just saying I just, that that that's that that industry wide. Just to answer, to answer, under, to answer I, your point, I, I know the example that you're using is this is what's been done, and I think that discounts what's being done now, right? So but it hadn't worked. Well, it hadn't worked up to well, now. We, we, don't, we don't know it hasn't I, why, why do we keep doing the same thing and expecting different well, results? Well, we're not. Uh, council member, we're not doing the same thing. And you can't say it hasn't worked because what we're doing now is one- It has not worked. We could absolutely no. say it has not worked. No. Council member, I think you passed a legislation, you voted on the legislation, Council Member Richards at the time introduced the legislation after speaking to an independent blue ribbon panel that reviewed our discipline process and suggested that we have presumptive penalty guidelines. So we did that. We worked on it. It just was finalized. It just came online less than a month ago. So it's not it's not fair to say that we're doing the same old thing and that's failing. I think the fair way to look at it is that we all agreed at the council's behest that we create presumptive, presumptive penalty guidelines. We created them. They were not easy to create, but we did. We looked at best practices from around the nation and we created our own. We left it open for public comment. We struck an MOU with CCRB, which is an independent body to stick with those guidelines. Let's see if it works. I mean, it was your legislation. It was so, our work so, together. So, so essentially you that's your answer, right? Essentially, that's your answer because that's a much better answer than 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 what what we were doing in the past works. Because clearly, what did, what we were doing in the past did not work. Clearly, uh, the 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 police commissioner having the authority as an independent arbiter was not oftentimes uh, consistent with that uh, represented by CCRB and others, and that also there was not the existing transparency that we're talking about now. Um, I, I, I again just submit that uh, to say to dismiss what everybody else is doing or other law enforcement or other municipal and governmental agencies are doing in terms of uh, discipline and collective bargaining, uh, that it has to be exclusively different when it comes to NYPD. I, I dismiss that, but I also would say that if there is a mechanism in place, that was agreed to that, you know, that perhaps it can be given a chance. Uh, but I, I would submit that, that, that there has to be a change. And, and hopefully um, between now and whatever happens and uh, any cases that uh, subsequently come before the commission, I hope that they are consistent with legislation that is currently uh, being, be, being practiced. So I, I, my time is up. I want to thank you for that, and I, I do want to take a deeper dive into the entire package and and uh, and uh, hear from you guys. So thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you. And Miller. Go ahead, Chelsea. No, I I just want to thank you for those comments, and we do think that the the best next steps here are to move forward with implementation of the matrix and the MOU with with full transparency um, and that just to reiterate, you know, how thoughtful we have to be about any um, changes over final authority, considering some of the potential unintended consequences. So um, appreciate those questions. Thank you. And, and you know, I just want to jump in here because a, a comment just jumped out at me and it, it has to do with uh, the perception of, uh, of, of things being seen through the lens of a police officer. And it was seemed to me that we would learn some lessons, particularly to my colleague, Councilmember Riley's point, that the actions of the uh, BLM protesters over the summer should make us think an entirely different way as, as far as any perceptions are concerned. 
um, why should offenses against the members of the public be viewed through the lens of enforcement instead of through the lens of a civilian? I think it should be viewed through all lenses. I mean, the, the, a review of a police officer's actions or the allegation of improper actions should be viewed in its totality. That's due process, that's fairness. There's no way to have a fair process. You know, it, it's very much about having the public trust the discipline process and trust police officers and have faith in how the discipline process works. But it's also equal, it, it's also important, equally as important, I would say, to have officers coming on the job considering a career in law enforcement that they have faith in the process as well, that they don't think that it's skewed against them in some way. So looking at it through an officer's perspective, I think is part of the comprehensive investigation into an allegation of impropriety. It's certainly not a disproportionate, shouldn't be given disproportionate weight, but it certainly should be looked at. I think fairness would call for that. I would agree, but, you know, if the commissioner is the final decision maker, you said yourself, he's going to look at it as a law enforcement officer, and that has clearly been an issue, correct? Well, I, I think before it gets to the police commissioner, there are multiple layers within the department when the recommendations for discipline come over from an outside entity like CCRB, where before it gets to the police commissioner, it's reviewed by the first deputy commissioner who's in overall in charge of training in our discipline process. And there's agreement that has to happen there. And th there's an independent review before it gets to the commissioner. So when I'm saying the having somebody taking a look at, you know, through the lens of law enforcement, it's being done as part of the comprehensive process. But ultimately it lands on the lap of the agency head, whether it, whether, mm -hmm. A police commissioner that's in charge of the personnel that fall under his or her agency has to be in charge ultimately of those personnel. So, Madam Chair, I'd like to add to that um, when, when you're thinking about that perspective. And we yeah. relate, and I, I want to relate it back to all the mishaps where we went wrong at with the protests this past summer. So, once those protests had occurred and things kind of calmed down somewhat, and even when we went and missed it, because I'm I'm managing protests every week, you know, yesterday, the day before yesterday. Um, with that being said, the police department as a whole sat down without any independent, anyone saying this is what you need to do. And we sat down as a whole at the table, took a look back at what could we have done better? Where did we go wrong at? And out of that came the retraining of several thousand members of the service because we realized they just weren't as trained in disorder control as they should have been. Uh, they were making independent decisions. They were making decisions based on if they responded to a different type of event and someone threw a bottle, oh, that's attempt to assault on me. My reaction is to arrest them. So since then, this training is ongoing. We have mock drills um, every week. Uh, we put a chief, a chief in place of operations where we had a deputy chief that held that position a long time ago, not just a chief, someone I know personally, a very experienced chief, uh, you know, to oversee the response in SRG, as well as the officers and ensuring that they have the proper training, the proper message goes out. I have weekly calls to address the demonstration protests every week. I have an inspector that's overseeing that, but I'm personally involved. We have community affairs at the helm now. So without officially having the DOI report implemented uh, into the reform reinvention, it's been implemented because I ensure that we have a strong community affairs presence out there. Uh, we know what we're dealing with. We know the bad actors now, whereas before we were met with this vast amount of people and you know, it was complete chaos. And, you know, since then, you can see the progress. There's less arrests made. I mean, the other night, unfortunately, we had a report assaulted, and there were a few arrests made behind that. But, you know, now you see the difference. The demonstration last night, uneventful. People went from Manhattan to the Bronx, and then they went home. And I really think that comes from the retraining 
the the advice that we've gotten from you know the, the reports feedback from the community especially during a lot of these listening sessions that's been being held in different forms related to reform and reinvention and also especially the retraining of the officers and the supervisory oversight that's out there um, so i i truly believe that moving forward it uh it can only get better because structure and systems are in place i just think it needed that structure regarding um demonstrations and protests which we deal with all the time but never something of that magnitude and uh, you know the young job that it is ensuring that four hours of training and disorder control was not enough and that's what they were receiving in the police academy so that has since since changed and i i think you'll feel and see the change with that and, and if i may add a, a little bit about the disciplinary matrix we did put it out for public comment and we did work with ccrb so the civilian view of discipline is baked into the guidelines that now we now have to use going forward, right? So that helps has helped the PC, help this department figure out what is appropriate penalties for a wide variety of misconduct. And we made some changes to our discipline based on that feedback. Um, and as Chelsea said, it's a living document. We'll continue getting feedback and updating it and making it as strong as possible. Thank you. I'm gonna go back to a council. I believe that uh, my colleagues have, have more questions. Thank you. Yes, uh, we have Councilmember Deutsch, um, and then I believe we're on the second round. Councilmember Deutsch. I'm uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, almost afternoon. But first, I want to speak about uh, the residency issue uh, that was brought up um, with the resolution. So firstly, I, I heard from the NYPD that they're looking into possibly making the change. Um, I think that's what I understood of um, looking to see if the officers should live in New York City. Um, you know, just not too long ago, we had a, a majority of New York City council members asking for fair market pay for officers. So I, I disagree with the fact that officers that um, live in New York City should only be allowed to be a New York City officer because we all know that the cost of living for an officer with a, a very low starting salary compared to other states um, is not feasible for that individual who protects us 24 seven. And when you have an officer who uh, becomes a cop and is a resident of New York City and then gets married and has a family, it's probably almost impossible um, for that officer to live in New York City with the cost of living and to prove it that, you know, majority of the city council did ask for fair market pay. And if, and if we get that fair market pay, then it's a discussion to talk about because no one should have to struggle um, how the next meal will be put on the table. So I just wanted to bring that point up. Um, secondly, I just wanted to, to mention that, um, you know, we spoke about, we're talking about now how to take away the um, discretion from the police commission and give it to an independent agency and oversight. Well, why, while I, I agree that if we're going to, you know, I have many issues and as well as my colleagues have issues in the district where um, I have traffic um, intersections that kill people literally uh, every single week, every single month. And when I reach out to the Department of Transportation and they don't um, make those intersections safe, right? I wish that there was an independent uh, agency that has oversight on that commissioner. When I'm trying to stop a Kangan homeless shelter in my district because there's not enough mental health services for the people, the, the homeless um, community living there, where we have just seen a, a person who was homeless with a mental health issue stab people on our trains. I wish that there was oversight on the commissioner of, uh, of HRA, of DHS, who will be an independent um, person uh, or agency to have oversight on that commissioner. But let's not single out one agency because we have many issues with all the agencies where people's lives depend on it. So if we're gonna do something, let's do it to every single agency across the board. Let's not single out one agency um, where we're taking away that power from that commissioner. I, as a council member, I have oversight of my office, my colleagues, have oversight in their offices. 
So why is the NYPD different than anyone else? But while I agree that maybe we should have an independent agency to have oversight, let's do this across the board, not just single out the NYPD. And that's where I disagree. And, and another thing I wanted to mention is that we have passed police reform bills over the last six years, and I served in the Public Safety Committee. Now, um, I respect my colleagues. I respect um, the work that they do. But what I disagree with is that we have bills that we have passed in the city council where we have regressed. For example, the diaphragm bill, we have regressed where we're, we're tying officers' hands from doing their jobs. I, I gave up my car to take a train two years ago. I am terrified now to take a train. I am terrified to take a train. So before we go into other police reform bills and um, keeping all those previous bills that we have um, put in place, right? We shouldn't work by piecemeal. We, we shouldn't say, okay, we're gonna put two bills today. Okay, they don't work. Let's, let's put another two bills in tomorrow or next month, let's put another two bills in. We constantly pass police reform bills and we see that New Yorkers are not happy. They are not happy. They don't feel safe. So before we continue with more police reform bills and holding the NYPD or other agencies accountable, let's repeal some of those bills. Let's repeal the diaphragm bill, which is not working. To many police reform um, individuals do across the state. They came out. Uh, and Kevin McCall came out against the diaphragm. I, I need another two minutes. And I think that before we continue and before we hold the NYPD um, and single them out and hold them accountable, let's look at the full picture because we as elected officials, we owe it to New Yorkers. And finally, I wanna make one more point. My colleague, uh, Councilmember Riley, mentioned about the peaceful protesters. And I agree, when peaceful protesters go out in the streets, and I have joined them, that we need to have oversight, we need to have police reform, we need to have training, we need to have sensitivity training. Everyone needs to be held accountable when there are peaceful protesters out on the streets. Why aren't my colleagues speaking about the non peaceful protesters, such as what we had this past Friday night. And if you're going to hold, if we're going to hold the NYPD accountable, let's hold ourselves accountable on the non-peaceful protesters. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to go back to Council Member 11, and I'll just ask any other Council Members who would like to come back for a second round to please use the Zoom raise hand function. Council Member 11. Time starts Thank now. you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, so my first question, I'm going to uh, pivot to the intro that I've introduced around qualified immunity. I know this was discussed before, but but I wasn't part of that discussion. So um, I want to read um, into the record um, uh, code section 1983, which is civil action for deprivation of rights. This is from 1871, post-Civil War, three years after the passage of the 14th Every person who under color of st any statute, ordinance, regulation, custom, or usage of any state or territory or the District of Columbia subjects or causes to be subjected, any citizen of the United States or other person within the jurisdiction thereof to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured by the Constitution and laws shall be liable to the person injured in an action at law, suit, in equity, or other proper proceeding for redress, except that in any action brought against a judicial officer for an act or omission taken of such officer's judicial capacity, injunctive relief shall be granted unless a declar declaratory decree was violated or declaratory relief was unavailable. For the purposes of this section, an act of any act of Congress applicable exclusively the District of Columbia shall be considered to be a statute of the District of Columbia. That's the relevant statute. That is the statute, the federal statute from 1871, governing the deprivation of anybody, of anybody in the United States, by anybody in the United States, 
the deprivation of their constitutional rights, their Fourth Amendment rights. So I want to ask, I'll give an example. I'll give an example from the police protest earlier this year. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave it as a, as a, as a hypothetical because I imagine you don't want to comment on specific cases. A hypothetical, where we have on video um, a police officer unprovoked um, pushing a unarmed uh, protester who is not threatening that officer, we see it clearly in the video, pushing them to the ground or punching them in the head. Um, is that officer entitled to qualify immunity in your opinion? So, sir, uh, thank you for that question. And you're right, uh, we will decline to comment on pending investigations or pending litigation, but I can say unequivocally that a police officer who violates the NYPD patrol guide is not entitled to representation or identification by the city of New York under state law, regardless of what defenses may be asserted in federal courts. That's the first point. The first point is that that person- Wait, wait, okay, so wait, 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 let's, let's, let's wait, just good. I want that to be, to be, let's suss that out a little bit. So you said regardless, so they're not entitled to defense by the city. So they have to hire their own defense attorney and they're not entitled to indemnification. Are they entitled to qualified immunity under federal statute, right? So again, you're- uh, no, I'm sorry, right. under, under, not under federal statute, excuse me, under, under the qualified immunity doctrine, the judicial so, doctrine of qualified immunity. So qualified immunity would only apply in the second circuit if there were no disputed issues of fact. So in the first instance, if the plaintiff in that case said, this happened to me and the officer said, no, it didn't, the qualified immunity defense is inapplicable in the second circuit. So assuming under your hypothetical that the incident is captured on video so that there is no dispute of fact, the court would then look at two things. One, whether uh, the uh, Second Circuit or Supreme Court of the uh, you know, United States Supreme Court or the New York State Court of Appeals has clearly established that an unprovoked physical assault violates the Fourth Amendment. If that okay, wait, 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 wait. Excuse me, excuse me. Let's let's just halt it right there. That the criticism of qualified immunity is that that is a very narrow band, and in fact, as it's been interpreted by the courts. It has to be an exact replication. And that's what they find as clearly defined um, uh, uh, fact pattern, is that it, it's not just an unprovoked assault. It has to be, it has to be a, a, a clearly established um, uh, precedent. And what we find is that the precedent exactly. never gets established. The, product, the, the, the precedent never gets established because, because it's always reliant on another precedent. So that's, so that, that's, the, that's, that's under the, the 1983 Supreme Court decision, which is the problem with qualified immunity to begin with, which is the reason why around the country, Republicans and Democrats have, have taken issue with the doctrine of qualified immunity. It is because this is not this is not some crazy left-wing uh, 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 way to kind of punish cops. I'm going to read you a quote. This is a quote. This is a quote. And I, and I will say, I agree with this quote. I agree with this quote. This quote. I don't want the cops to lose their house, but I do want people to have to think twice. That's when change will happen, is when people feel the sting of bad policy. One thing I can tell you, if you're subject to being sued, you act differently than if you're not. Let's take a look at it. It, it being qualified immunity doctrine uh, statutorily. That quote is from South Carolina Republican Senator Lindsey Graham last year. Yes, sir, you're last year. identifying a federal problem that requires a federal solution and your bill not only does not solve for that problem, but it creates a new series of problems that directly impacts public safety. So I do want to speak specifically to some so of excuse the- me, Excuse me, but you just acknowledged a federal problem. 
Council member, we're, 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 oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Council, we're, we're in New York City. First of all, listen, we, we need to be able to answer these questions because I think your colleagues will benefit <laughs> from actually <laughs> understanding our right, but, 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 except, except, So, except, I mean, except, respectfully, except, respectfully, this respectfully. Is, I, I like, like, I no, no, excuse me, excuse me. What I'm saying is, I am interjecting because I'm trying to suss out. I know, but you're like, sussing I'm, out and interrupting me, our listener. I'm, but I'm sussing out. Very, these are, these are, these, are, these terms need to be defined. Can you please let us finish our answer and you can follow up and suss out as much as you would like to suss out? Okay. Okay. And we need to be able to answer these questions and without being interrupted. That's the point. So okay, we, then do me a favor and don't then don't repeat the same answer fifteen times oh, like yeah. the last round of. We're questions. not repeating the same answer fifteen times. We're making points that clearly weren't visited in drafting this legislation. We certainly weren't consulted or asked for input. This certainly was not an inclusive process before this bill was introduced. Yet you've introduced this bill. Okay, you've okay. acknowledged that the city is having a homicide spike, is having a shooting spike, and this bill directly impacts the homicide and shooting rate in this city because what you are doing uh, in this bill, based on the way this bill is drafted, is penalizing police officers for acting lawfully and penalizing every other police officer at the scene for not intervening when their colleague is acting lawfully. That's what this bill does. Now, if you want to talk about the it's problems in the federal statute, it's not, it's not penalizing, that. but there's we no, there's not, no, we will like not there's change no problem, federal law based on this conversation. There's no problems in the federal statute. There's no problems in the federal statute. Qualified immunity is not statutory. Qualified immunity is a judicial doctrine interpreting the federal statute that goes back 130 years. So, I mean, so is 50 absolute years. prosecutorial immunity um, is the same way. And I appreciate your, your concern, sir. I, I know a lot of it is driven um, and makes reference to the Cato Institute piece and, and the quotes from Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas. I think, you know, going back to uh, revisit the emergence of the doctrine of qualified immunity and the, the judicial history, as you put it, um, behind that doctrine is, is important. And again, part of a broader conversation about federal law. Uh, but I will say again, in the Second Circuit, the Second Circuit does not take the approach to clearly established standard that you are decrying that exists in some of the other circuits. You could look at that Boyer's analysis, the Second Circuit, has dismissed fewer than 25 cases, excessive force cases on qualified immunity grounds in over 15 years. So we but do that, have that, an that, emerging that, that, body of case, excuse me, sir. How many have they rejected? Have, we do have how an many? emerging and growing body of case law in the Second Circuit that clearly establishes for our officers boundaries that we use to inform policy and training. We look very closely at federal civil rights litigation in this jurisdiction to ensure that our officers have the best policy and the best training and that we are informed by those litigations. They are not stunted in New York City by the qualified immunity defense. Excuse me, let me, let me interject that that's not taking into account cases that are not brought because of qualified immunity as a deterrence to bringing suit. So you're just, you're just citing the number of cases where qualified immunity is granted, but not the cases where that are not that, that are never brought in federal court because because a, a an, an attorney, a plaintiff's attorney, says, "Listen, we keep, you can't you can't bring suit due to qualified immunity." How many cases were uh, was qualified immunity rejected as a defense in 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 the in, in the Second Circuit? Probably thousands. I can't give you an exact number, but qualified immunity must considered be considered invoked and, and rejected by the courts. Yeah, I'm going to interrupt because I'm going to ask you to wrap, Councilmember Levin, so we can get our uh, our other colleague in here. So I'm just going to ask you to wrap. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I this is where that's I. Well, you're saying that thousands of times in the second in the Second Circuit uh, uh, that that officers have sought to invoke qualified immunity. As a, as a as a 
as a this is not this is an immunity defense. This means that you it's not it's not a a, a, a defense against um uh, uh like a as a this is a a, a way to 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 be absolute to to be immune from from suit. You're saying that in instance there have been thousands of instances where they've brought up that defense and the courts have rejected the federal courts have rejected that defense explicitly. Is that well, right? First of all, I want to point out that 74.4 percent of lawsuits brought against members of the NYPD resolve via settlement. So it's a full settlement to assume that the majority no, no. are litigated to this issue of qualified immunity. But settlement is a different set, settlement is a different right. question. Settlement right. is in, 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 so, there are plenty of cases that the city settles because they don't want to deal with a public fallout. Yes. Where they don't want to deal with prolonged to pro prolonged litigation. So let's take settlements and put them aside. So cases like where I'm question. asking about cases in the Second Circuit, yes, I'd where, like to where, where it's invoked and rejected. So I'd like to answer that question. So qualified immunity is an affirmative defense that must be pleaded and proved by police officers. The answer to your question is yes. Qualified immunity is pleaded as an affirmative defense in probably the majority of the, you know, uh, 1800 or so complaints filed against the, the police and our, and our officers per year. And in the great majority of those cases, those cases proceed through discovery and oftentimes trial before the question of qualified immunity is adjudicated. And I am not aware of, uh, of really any case where uh, the I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm confused by your question. Are you assuming that the officers are not raising qualified immunity or you're assuming that it's always- successful? I'm assuming, what well, I'm asking you when, if they raise qualified immunity, how many times, how many instances, you 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 cited the number of instances in which qualified immunity Was, is uh, accepted as a defense. Yes. And, but you did not cite the number of times when qualified immunity is invoked by the officer as a defendant mm -hmm. and, and that defense is then rejected by the courts. So I would say near it, probably hundreds of times a year. Um, and, and again, that's a good faith guesstimate. Go back to Bradley versus the city of New York is the second circuit case that says that if the plaintiff and the defendant disagree on the facts, qualified immunity doesn't apply, which is a primary reason in the second circuit why qualified immunity is rarely granted. Qualified so I was just looking at the case, the, the case, the case sure, from I, Binghamton. Sure, I got to finish. I got to finish here. Qualified immunity okay, also right. does not protect the city from liability, which means claims against the city can continue to be litigated even if the officer is entitled to qualified immunity. And qualified immunity also does not apply to state and state court. So it's a point where you're saying it's a deterrent from people seeking redress because of this doctrine of qualified immunity. People bring claims in state court and receive full redress. In negligence state claims. Court. Let negligence claims. No, I was reading no, last no, night no, the Binghamton no, case. False the Binghamton case. Assault and wrongful death can be brought and are brought in state court with great frequency against this agency and our employees. And people receive full and fair just compensation in those cases. So it's from the city, from the city, but the but the officer themselves are immune from oh, any liability. Sir, that's that's not only false, but it fails to take into account the interplay with indemnification. If officers violate department policy or the law, they are not entitled to indemnification of the state's general municipal law 50K. So immunity does not bear on whether or not the officer pays out of pocket. They're two completely different issues. The officer pays out of pocket for his or her own defense, settlement, and judgment if they violate department policy or the law under today's standards. That is what happens. Whether or not their own attorney raises a qualified immunity defense in federal court does not bear upon whether or not that person is financially liable for the cost, at least of their own defense, if not for the judgment. And I'm happy to go deeper on these issues at, at any time. It's incredibly complex, the intersection between federal and state law but I just want to again point out to the extent that there are issues, 2009, Pearson versus Callahan sequencing, we could go all the way through that, but they are not resolved by your bill. Let me ask you a question and a last, last final question. So you read through the Cato Institute paper on, on, uh, on qualified immunity. What is, what is your response to the assertions in that paper? Well, there are, are they are they are they invalid? I think there are there are lots of assertions in the in the Cato Institute paper 
that are valid, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't cite to a single Second Circuit case, let alone a case involving the NYPD. It does not advocate for strict liability with no available affirmative defenses for law enforcement officers. It doesn't argue against indemnification as a matter of policy. It doesn't consider outcomes in state courts like in New York where parallel claims are readily available. And it does not posit that municipalities can or should step in instead of Congress to pass new laws that replace Section 1983. Nor does it argue that state courts are at all equipped to grow the body of federal constitutional law that came to an abrupt halt following the decision of Pearson versus Callahan. So if we're, we're sitting in Congress right now having a conversation about Section 1983, we could go through what the Cato Institute's fault is taking from Pearson versus Ray and its you know, progeny, progeny that followed. Um, but it's simply, it's, it's not a city council issue and it's not something that your bill addresses. It's, wait, it's not a city council issue because why? Because we don't have jurisdiction? Over 28 U.S.C. 1983 in federal court, correct. We don't, we don't have the jurisdiction to create a, a city-based civil law that is based on a civil rights law that is that is verbatim the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution? We don't have the authority to do that? I'm not saying that you don't have authority to create a, a, yet another parallel a cause of action in, in state court. What I'm saying is that it's unnecessary and that the way that you drafted the bill has unintended consequences that are at odds with what the Cato Institute is recommending and are grossly at odds with what the state of Colorado did to address the issues in their jurisdiction. Okay, but you don't dispute that we have the authority, the, 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 the jurisdiction to, to, create a state, to create a state civil rights law, uh, a cause of action um, in, in in state court that because it, if we were you're you would, you've acknowledged I, 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 I let you I let you I let you speak I want to just get this out that you acknowledge prior in the record that there is a problem quote unquote problem existing in federal law right now in 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 the federal in the, in the federal courts doctrine of qualified immunity, that is a problem. I'm, I'm quoting you verbatim. You said, excuse me, you said problem. In other and excuse, excuse me, excuse me, let me finish. That that is a problem and it is a problem and it is a problem for Congress to fix, essentially is what you're saying. And in other jurisdictions that are impacted by the problem that I described in circuits that are not ours, yes. But we don't have a problem here is what you're saying. Oh. Is that what you're saying? We don't have a problem? There's no problem to solve here? <laughs> but I mean, I, I don't understand the question. You're saying there's a problem federally. You're saying that there's a problem federally, but there's not a problem. But we don't, but that problem doesn't exist in the second circuit, is what you're saying. And in the state of New York, because here plaintiffs can receive full, fair, and just compensation when they suffer harm, and our cops are not protected from paying out of pocket by the state's indemnification law. So yes, the problem that exists in other jurisdictions that the federal legislature needs to solve does not exist in New York State and in the Second Circuit because our combination of state and federal laws and practices under General Municipal Law 50K and 28 U.S.C. 1983 as applied by the Second Circuit do not create barriers for plaintiffs to receive just compensation and do not allow police officers to, be, uh, uh, to get away without paying when they violate police policy or law. So yes, I'm okay. saying so that's, 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 that's Excuse me, that's a good place to start this conversation. That you believe that there is no problem in the second circuit and in New York state courts around qualified immunity. So let's, let's leave it there. Um, you believe that there's not a problem and we can have that discussion about whether there is a problem, there's not a problem in New York City when it comes to qualified immunity. We'll leave it there. Final okay. question. Final I would question. ask a member before, you know, I, I just wanna, I'm not gonna subscribe to that characterization at the end there. I think uh, Executive Director Dates made a very compelling case. We're gonna make ourselves available to all council members that are entertaining this legislation. It's fatally flawed. It's completely unfair and it will endanger New Yorkers as written. I also just wanna clarify, um, especially for many people that don't have the obviously expertise on this issue um, that Liz has that 
we, we absolutely do think there should be liability for reasonable action. What we're trying to avoid is having someone be punished for something that they, they couldn't have known was a problem. If someone's actions are currently illegal, there are state and federal remedies. Um, officers who engage in activity that violate the procedure are not, only, are not indemnified by the city, are liable in state and federal court. Um, this bill would, would punish officers when following policy and procedures. Um, who couldn't have known that their actions were prohibited and, and that's what we're concerned with with today. So I know we're being asked to wrap up and um, thank you for this dialogue, but I, I wanted to clarify um, those, you know, those major concerns. Thank you, Ms. Davis. We'll now turn to Council Member Yeager for questions. Thank you, good afternoon. Um, first, I, I just, on the last uh, exchange, I, I don't think that they would reasonably believe that this statute mirrors section 1983. And I think I'll illustrate that with the following. Uh, I'm gonna read from section 8-804 of this introduction. It is also not a defense to liability pursuant to this chapter that the covered individual was acting in good faith or reasonably or otherwise that the conduct of such individual was lawful at the time it was committed. Uh, in section, uh, subsection three of that is that the state of law was otherwise such that the covered individual could not reasonably have been expected to know whether the conduct of such covered individual was lawful. Um, so with that background, and, and, and section 1983 is very clear that it, it comes into play when the constitution and, and the jurisprudence of the fifth amendment, fourth amendment constitutional protections are violated. So with that in play, um, uh, I'd like to ask uh, NYPD and the mayor's office uh, the following hypothetical. A parks department employee is on the bucket of his truck uh, uh, pruning a tree. And uh, halfway through cutting the branch, picks up his cell phone to respond to a text from a family member. And the branch comes down and crashes on something or their property. Is there a law in this city that holds that parks department personally liable to the plaintiff in a lawsuit? Sir, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer that question on, on behalf of uh, the city's law department uh, or the parks department. I, I simply don't know the answer to that. I, I do not believe that there's any in the city that holds city uh, employees personally liable without coverage by general municipal law 50K. Uh, that, that is my understanding. Okay, I'm gonna give you, um, uh, so uh, with that, let me give you another scenario. 9-11, uh, oh. 911 call comes through and the caller says that they hear blood curdling screams coming from a home. It sounds like somebody's being stabbed. Two officers are dispatched, they show up at the door and sure enough, they hear exactly that. They call for backup and in the meantime, the screams keep on going. They knock on the door, they ring the bell, there's no answer. They look at each other and they decide that they're going to go through the door and they're going to save a life. They walk in and in the in front, front room is Nightmare on Elm Street playing at full volume. And then they look around right in the corner is a guy sitting at a desk and counting out 400 envelopes of heroin. They arrest him for possession of drugs with intent to sell and the judge decides in Queens County criminal term, that the exigent circumstances exceptions to the, to the, to the Fourth Amendment didn't exist. So the, so, the, so the evidence is out. So the defendant goes free. Under this statute, correct me if I'm wrong, the defendant now has a claim against the city of New York and up to a $25,000 claim against the two officers individually. Correct. Are you reading the law now? Correct, yes. Correct. Okay. So, now, having, having put this down, and I know that, you know, sometimes I go for the hyperbole to make the point, but how frequently in this city is evidence thrown out, not because it was unlawfully obtained, not because it was without warrant, but because a reasonable officer in the circumstances of these two officers, in the mind of the particular judge who was hearing the case at that point, on a close call, 50.1 to 49.9 lies in favor of the Constitution and says the search is out, the evidence is out, 
the stop is out, therefore, with nothing else, the case is out. We all know that that actually happened, that, that the evidence was there on the table, that they saw the guy with a gun in his waistband, that the gun was in plain view on the, on the passenger seat of the car during the stop for going through a red light. But the judge says, close call, the Constitution wins on a close call. On all of these cases, the officer is personally on the hook, notwithstanding, and again, reading from, from this proposed bill, that the individual was acting in good faith, believed that the conduct was lawful at the time it was committed, and that the state of law was such that the individual could not reasonably have been expected to know whether the conduct of such individual was lawful. And the city council is proposing a piece of legislation that would ask officers to make that judgment before they go into an apartment that they hear blood curdling screams, they turn to each other and say, why is this our problem? When they stop a guy for going through a red light and they see the handgun, they say, you know what, you go. Why? It's not, is that worth our public safety in anyone's estimation? We're talking now about a scenario where it's very clear that crime is up in this city. It's very clear. We're coming through a weekend where a guy stabbed four people, murdered two of them, 17 days after he was in police custody of a felon assault. I didn't put him back out on the street. The police didn't decide that he's gonna go back out on the street. He was in police custody. If a judge had put him away for the public safety, two people would be alive today Two others would not, would not have heinous injuries. We're asking cops to understand that we're going to pass a law in this council that is, going to in, that is going to put them personally, personally at risk, making a good judgment call that any one of us would want done if the possible was a member of our family. How much sense does this make? We, it's not a question, by the way. We, I understand the, the notion that we've gone through in the last couple of months here in this council and, and the national conversation as well about police and their relationships with communities. And it's, it's a particular balancing act because obviously police are faced with, with enormous powers. They can stop somebody against their will. I, I see somebody doing something I don't like, I can't tell them to stop, I can tell them to stop, they don't have to listen to me. The police have the ability to take away somebody's freedom. In, in New York, the number of people, the number of entities or, or professions that have the ability to do that are limited to the police, a psychiatrist, and a judge. Nobody else can do that. Firefighter can't do that, nobody else can do that. It's, it, it, in that light, it makes sense for us to look at situations and scenarios where individually there has been a police officer who may have not acted properly individually. But this idea in New York City that we have 35,000 cops and the people need protection from the police, we have to really stop doing that. That's not true. It's not true. I'm a lifelong New Yorker. I lived in this city my entire life. I know, yes, Steve, you can laugh if you want. I know you're also a lifelong New Yorker. I, I, you're, you're muted, I know. If we were in the chambers, we'd be going back and forth and enjoying it. Um, the idea that the cops are our enemy and that the city's, legislator, it, the, the city's legislature is perpetuating this as a falsehood to the public is so wrong, so unacceptable. We really need to do a little bit better. There are things we can do to make our communities have better relationships. The city council has done that. The city council did it in the last session by requiring the right to know law, by requiring that police officers identify themselves, hand over a business card. There are things this council has done that in some people's estimation made sense and some people's estimation didn't make sense. But on balance, we are getting to a better place than we had in the past. But this idea that the 35,000 members of New York City police department are the enemies of the people 
is, is such an outrage. And, and just because you don't use those words doesn't mean that's not what you're saying. And we're doing this in this council for the last couple of months. I, I'm not really sure that there's a good public policy reason, but we are doing it. Um, I don't really, beyond the question that I had for the city, I don't really have any more questions, but I've listened to this this morning. Um, I've listened to the debate on this, and, and, and I, I think that we can take a step back and really think about whether or not, for example, a right of private action against an individual cop who makes a good judgment call is really the best thing we can do to promote public safety in, in New York City. The question of whether or not the city council should have advice and consent on the police commissioner is a fair question. And we do have advice and consent on some commissioners. I would argue that this city council, this particular city council, this session of the council in which I am privileged to serve ought not have that privilege. It doesn't mean that the council as an entity, as a body, as a legislature shouldn't have um, consent. But I would also suggest that there are a lot of commissioners in this city and their jobs are very important to a lot of places in the city. For example, the Department of Transportation, I'd like to have an opinion on who the commissioner ought to be. Um, uh, the school's chancellor, and I know that we can't legislate that in the city, but the school's chancellor is a very important job. And I don't think there's any member of this council that doesn't think we should have the right to opine on who the school's chancellor ought to be. The corrections commissioner, the fire commissioner, these are all very important jobs. And it's one department that we're making this proposal for, one department, police commissioner, as if somehow the police commissioner is the enemy of the people, but the 51 of us are gonna stand up and protect the people from the police commissioner. It's disgusting. You're gonna say that you didn't say that and it's okay. This is not targeted to any particular member. It's targeted to the conversation. And with that, Madam Speaker, thank you for giving me the extra time. I appreciate it and I yield back. Thank you, Councilman. I see no other uh, council member hands raised, so I'll turn it back to the chair uh, for the final question. If any other council members do have uh, uh, do wish to ask any more questions, please use the Zoom hand raise function. Sorry, I I, I, um, I just wanted to say before um, that the hearing concludes that. Um, Changing the culture of policing, defining the role of police, and creating trust and legitimacy with communities, really reconceptualizing safety to be more than just about law enforcement, but about community resources and, and working with communities to define public safety for themselves is really not a simple or, or a quick task. Um, and so we deeply appreciate the partnership of, of the council in, in putting together this reform plan. And I, I wanna thank you for um, having us here to talk about this today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. I, I just had one more question um, for you before we just um, and it has to do with the plan itself. Once again, uh, because it's been more than a month since we were here to talk about the plan. So my question is, have you reached out to any of the groups that testified last month? Um, we have been continuing continuing engagement and um, we can follow up with the list of, of meetings that we've had. Um, I know that we have spoken to, to some of the groups that have testified, so um, not all of them. Um, we also um, are still you know, hoping to speak to people. Um, if they reach out to us, we're always willing to meet. Um, we have been working very diligently to write the, the report and and we're working you know, with you, council uh, member in the speaker's office. We'll continue to do so over the next few weeks. Um, we are very committed to this. Um, the mayor is very committed to this, um, as evidence has already been announced. Um, and the report will be coming out in the coming days. Um, and we hope that that the draft report, as well as the final report, will not be the end of our engagement with community members, um, including many groups that we heard from last month. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, first panel, uh, it's we've been on for a while, and, and it really, I just wanted to say this uh, because I think that it's important. This is the purpose of hearing. This is the purpose of legislative hearing. So the the robust conversation and debate that goes on during hearings is necessary. It's necessary that we are transparent in our hearings. It's necessary that we allow all sides to get their sides known to the public so that we know there are no surprises. No one can say that we didn't hear this in the hearing. 
everybody has an opportunity to speak. And while we know that the public, your input is important and we look forward to your testimony, our advocates, everyone, we look forward to your testimony. But the testimony between the agencies and the council is critical, critical to getting information and debate, honest debate on the table when it comes to legislation of the city council. So with that, I thank you panel for being here today. Thank you for your testimony this morning. And uh, council, I will defer to you at this point. Thank you, Chair. The next panelist to give testimony, uh, and thank you to the administration. The next panelist will be another member of the administration, the Chair of the Civilian Complaint Review Board, uh, Frederick Davey. Before we get, begin testimony, I will administer the oath. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, I was just about to check in with you. Um, if you may, uh, please raise your right hand. I will read the oath and then call on you for a response. Do you swear to affirm or tell do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. You may begin your testimony. Thank you. Um, and thank you all. Thank you, uh, Chair Adams, and thanks to the rest of the council members for inviting me to testify today on behalf of the Civilian Complaint Review Board. I'm testifying in support of the resolution calling on New York State Legislature to pass legislation that gives CCRB final authority over discipline in CCRB cases. As stated in the resolution, allowing the CCRB to impose, impose discipline in certain cases would be a concrete step in increasing accountability and public trust in the city's commitment to hold officers accountable when they commit misconduct. Over the past month, the CCRB has adopted the NYPD matrix signed an MOU with the NYPD, ensuring CCRB's access to officer employment history in substantiated cases and committing the department to CCRB's recommendations except in extraordinary circumstances, adopted new rules allowing us to investigate cases of sexual misconduct and untruthful statements, and continue to fight for the release of all pol police disciplinary records after the repeal of 50A. City Hall and the mayor have encouraged these changes and others, including the mayor's announcement of the David Dinkins plan to expand and strengthen the CCRB. While all of these changes represent significant steps to improving transparency and greater accountability, I believe that granting the CCRB final authority to impose discipline in CCRB cases is a concrete change that can truly transform police accountability in New York City. Every investigation entails a thorough evaluation of the conduct in question, with the board ultimately scrutinizing the evidence to determine whether a member of the NYPD violated the law, the patrol guide, or both. However, New Yorkers continue to see examples of substantiated misconduct that ultimately resulted in little to no penalty from the NYPD. In an effort to change this dynamic, New Yorkers voted to change their charter and require the police commissioner to provide an explanation to the CCRB whenever the NYPD does not follow the board's disciplinary recommendations. Similarly, the newly appointed, the newly adopted matrix and MOU also include provisions requiring the police, commission to, police commissioner to provide an explanation when the NYPD does not follow the agency's recommendations. However, even these steps in the right direction, and even with these steps in the right direction, many people in this city, and I count myself among them, believe final authority for CCRB cases resting with the CCRB is the only sure way to restore and maintain the public's trust in this disciplinary process. I've made this point to the police commissioner, to the mayor, and I make it here again today. I believe the proposed resolution calling on the state legislature to grant the CCRB final disciplinary authority would be the culmination of the initial steps taken by these other reforms. Absent legislative changes in Albany, I believe the city has done the extent of what it can to solve the problems that contribute to the lack of concurrence between the CCRB's recommendations and the department's final decisions. The disciplinary matrix published in January and the memorandum of understanding Commissioner Shea and I signed on February 4th are steps the city was able to take on its own. 
and were the right, significant, and even breakthrough steps to improve the NYPD's concurrence with the CCRB's recommendations. However, until we address the issue of the police commissioner's broad discretion over discipline in, an, in impartial, independent civilian investigations, these issues will persist regardless of the composition of the board, the city council, the police department, or city hall. It is my concern that until the issue of final disciplinary authority is dealt with, any additional efforts to improve police community relations through oversight will falter, and we cannot let that happen. I want to thank all of you for having me here today to discuss this important issue. I want to echo the language within the proposed resolution, that is, to those, all, all, to those lawmakers in Albany who may be contemplating this change, the time to act is now. Complete the work begun by New York City's first and only black mayor, a man I am proud to have worked for, the late Mayor David Dinkins, who created the Civilian Complaint Review Board as we know it. Complete that work, that is to provide the agency with binding disciplinary authority. I thank you. Thank you, Chair Davey. Um, and we do have a few questions from several council members, so please do remain unmuted for now. Um, I'll turn it over to the chair. Thank you, council. Uh, chair Davey, it's good to see you as always. Thank you for being here. You. Uh, I just had one question uh, along the lines of what your testimony uh, pretty much just stated. And I'll, I'll just say for the record, I am uh, hopeful about the disciplinary matrix and MOU uh, although ultimately um, all doors still lead to final authority by the police commissioner. So uh, I'm going to ask you this, in your tenure as chair of the CCRB, how often have you seen your decisions and the decisions of your body disregarded in lieu of the final decision by the police commissioner? Well, if we focus just on the uh, APU uh, and we can get you the administrative prosecution unit and we can get you the numbers on the more uh, general uh, cases, the less serious cases, but if we focus just on APU, the latest data I saw suggested that for 2020, uh, there was a 8% uh, concurrence rate uh, for APU cases. And then I think the average APU concurrence rate over all the years since the APU has been in existence since 2013 is about 40%. Okay, that's, that's what I had heard. I had heard the 40% as well. I just wanted to get that on the record. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it uh, back over to council to uh, get questions from my colleagues. Thank you. Council member Levin followed by council member Miller. Starting time. Thank you. Uh, uh, Council, I just want to thank Chair Davey for, um, for being here and testifying today and for um, uh, you know, establishing the prerogative of the CCRB in this process um, and, um, and for, for, for speaking out publicly on this issue um, in a way that might not necessarily um, um, be comfortable for him, um, but uh, but it's necessary. And so I just I greatly appreciate his candor and, and uh, his willingness um, to to speak on this issue publicly in a way that uh, that moves this conversation forward. Um, and so I just greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member Miller. Starting time. Um. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a question, and, and that is, uh, what is the total number of cases that, that go on to be recommended for discipline? Um, on average, I, I would say it's, it's several thousand, but again, Council Member, I'll have, uh, I'll have our staff get you those specific numbers right away. Okay, and, 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 uh, in those numbers, would it identify the, the varying levels of, of, of discipline and infractions that have occurred? Um, and could you aggregate them accordingly? Yes, we can provide that pretty quickly, I'm sure. Wow, 
that. How, how many cases did uh, CCRB hear last year? Uh, that is a very good question. I'm gonna I'm gonna guess in the in the low thousands, but again, we'll get you that specific number. Okay, and 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 um, what, what, your investigators and and uh, those within the purview there. What, what do those numbers look like? I'm trying to get at what, what, what the level of investigation. Um, man hours in, included um, and then ultimately uh, uh, you know how, how could, could you just speak to uh, what that investigative process and what the process looks like determining uh, to get you to the point to suggest uh, after um, uh, determining uh, uh, guilt what the level of discipline should be Sure, it, it's, a, it's a really involved process um, in that we get a, the agency gets a complaint. Um, uh, it, is, uh, it is turned over to an investigator. Uh, obviously the investigator reaches out to the complainant. If the complainant is not the victim, the investigator will also reach out to the victim. Uh, the investigator will see if there are any witnesses, if there's any uh, uh, video or other uh, evidence involved. As you know, there is, the agency does have subpoena power, so it can subpoena evidence. Mm -hmm. um, all of that evidence is a mass. Victims are interviewed, officers involved are interviewed. Um, then the investigator writes up what we call a, a, a closing report. That's obviously in consultation with their supervisors and the legal team at the CCRB. Um, and then that information is uh, shared with a panel of, uh, made up of uh, the members of the board who then make a decision uh, based on the uh, evidence that has been amassed and the recommendations that come from the investigators. And our task is either to substantiate, unsubstantiate, exonerate, or find unfounded uh, within our jurisdiction um, the, the information that comes before us uh, assign a penalty to it, which would now be governed by the matrix that we've all talked about and that's now being used. And then those recommendations, uh, both in terms of the disposition of the cases and the penalties that attach to them, go over to the department for the department's review and then the police commissioner's final decision. Has there been any, been any cases thus far that have met the criteria of the new matrix and have, have you moved forward with, with, with those suggestions. And, and then further in the interest of, oh, well, I do have a minute. Um, and, and the interest of time is that uh, the administration implied that, um, that because of the police commissioner's uh, experience that, uh, that it uniquely qualified him to, to uh, uh, be the final arbiter of, of, of discipline um, that within the, because of the, the nuances of the police department that it required a, a, a specific expertise. Would you agree? And, and if you do, do you, uh, would you say that, that, that um, CCRB and those investigators have that level of expertise? And if you don't, why? So um, I do believe that the CCRB has a level of expertise to have final disciplinary authority. I think that's made it um, even stronger by this matrix. Although as we've all said, and as the department said, the matrix is a, is a living document and we'll have to pay attention to it and to see how it works uh, you know, over time and make whatever adjustments we need I'm to expired. make. It works as well as it possibly can. But um, I, I have great confidence in the ability of the CCRB to uh, make uh, good and sound decisions uh, about uh, recommended police discipline, uh, particularly again using uh, using uh, this this matrix as as it's been established, um, and actually, um, and you know, under the MOU that we've signed with the police commissioner uh, and the department. Uh, there would be no changes in CCRB's recommendations going forward, except under, under um, extraordinary circumstances. And I don't think there's anything in the past year 
that any uh, decision that's been overturned that the CCRB has made that would qualify as an extraordinary circumstance. So I'm, the conclusion there is that the decisions that the CCRB made uh, were, uh, were uh, uh, logical and reasonable and, uh, and defensible, justifiable decisions uh, as an oversight body. Um, I think that that would be acknowledged under this new arrangement. And so why wouldn't the agency then have final authority uh, on, on its cases? Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, I don't see any other uh, council members with that are using the hand raise function. Um, Chair, I'm not sure if you have any more questions. I don't, uh, thank I just, you. All right, you meant that, Chair. I'm sorry, Chair Adams. Just, just to Councilmember Miller's point, and this may help you out, Chair Davey, if there's anyone still here uh, that heard uh, Councilmember Miller's questions with regard to the statistics of the CCRB and can perhaps help with any of those numbers, um, if you can just state that now. If not, we will uh, dismiss our our chair for CCRB. So either Ms. Davis or any members of the NYPD, if you were listening to Councilmember Miller's questions, if you got um, any response to when certain records would be released. Okay, I hear no response. Hi, sorry, this, this is Chelsea. I, I am still here um, and we can get back to you with the answers. And, and I can tell you that in uh, the staff and chair, Chair Adams? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, the the um, CCRB received 3,875 complaints uh, in our jurisdiction, in the agency's jurisdiction in 2020. Um, that was down some because of COVID and during regular years, there are between 4,500 and 5,000 cases within the CCRB. Okay, Council Council Member, Member. I think you uh, heard that. It's, it's pretty much, as the chair said, a little over 3,000. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Davey and uh, Committee Council. We'll move on to the next panel. Council, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, we will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin your testimony once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist, you should use the Zoom hand raise function and I will call on you in the order you raise your hand after the panelists has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer then give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Um, I will now read the names of the first few witnesses and then I'll come back to the first. Um, the first four will be Molly Griffard from the Late, Scott Levy from Bronx Defenders, Sergio De La Pava, New York County Defender Services, and Alexander Fisher from Brooklyn Defender Services. Molly Griffard, Legal Aid. Starting time. Ms. Griffard, you may begin. I apologize if I was just called. I had an issue with my, with my um, headphones. You Am I up? Yes, you are. You may be All right. Good. So sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Chair Adams and the Public Safety Committee and all other council members who have joined us today. My name is Molly Grifford. I'm a legal fellow with the Legal Aid Society's COP Accountability Project. We've submitted written testimony with our detailed positions and suggested amendments on each of the bills being considered today. 
And while we support some of the bills brought forth today, we must emphasize that these proposals do fall short of what is necessary to bring about the fundamental changes to policing that New Yorkers are demanding. Our Legal Aid Society clients come from some of the most over-policed and under-resourced communities in our city. Our clients regularly experience the worst of police misconduct, and I want to share one such example with you today. One summer night in 2018, Tomas Medina was listening to music with his friends in Washington Heights. Detective Fabio Nunez heard the music and approached. He quickly escalated the situation, putting Mr. Medina in a chokehold and tasing him 13 times. Almost two years ago, the CCRB investigated and substantiated the chokehold and taser abuse allegations against Nunez. However, the NYPD has yet to schedule a disciplinary trial or issue so much as a reprimand to Detective Nunez. Detective Nunez, in the meantime, has continued abusing civilians, accruing additional CCRB complaints, including yet another substantiated chokehold allegation. To the NYPD and de Blasio administration representatives here today, who have told us over and over again that we need to give the disciplinary matrix time to work. We'd like to see it, show us that it works. Why are officers like Fabio Nunez, Wayne Isaacs, David Greco, and so many others notorious for abusing civilians still on the force? Schedule their trials, follow through with terminating them. If they are going to claim additional reforms are not necessary, then show us that the system is fixed. Meanwhile, we welcome the council's efforts to increase police accountability. Something that Mr. Medina's case illustrates is sorely lacking. And this brings me to two very specific issues regarding the bills under consideration today uh, that I'll highlight here, but otherwise our, our uh, feedback is in our written testimony. First, on Council Member Combo's resolution 1538 on NYPD discipline. We support the council calling upon Albany to take the necessary steps to remove the police commissioner's exclusive authority over police discipline. However, the council will be responsible for the next steps, and we encourage the council to consider options for moving not just final disciplinary determinations, but also adjudication to an independent non-NYPD agency. We cannot expect the NYPD disciplinary system to work when NYPD employees serve as judge and jury in all disciplinary trials, when they alone have the power to schedule Time trials. Uh, thank you. Uh, may I wrap up? Thank you so much. Uh, and they alone have the power to schedule trials and they serve as prosecutor in most cases, uh, which also allows them to reach settlement agreements that aren't uh, in keeping with the disciplinary matrix. Second, on Council Member Levin, uh, Levine's uh, qualified immunity bill, the NYPD's pattern of racist and abusive policing is not limited to Fourth Amendment violations and neither should this legislation. Uh, as currently drafted, the bill doesn't actually eliminate qualified immunity in important contexts like racial discrimination and assaults on protesters' rights. While this bill is clearly a step forward, we urge the council to expand the bill to truly eliminate qualified immunity for all civil rights violations. And thank you so much uh, to the council for having us here today. I'm happy to take questions on our written testimony or uh, testimony today. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Grifford. Thank you. Next up will be Scott Levy, followed by Sergio Della Papa. Starting time. Thank you. Um, my name is Scott Levy, and I am Chief Policy Counsel at the Bronx Defenders. Um, I want to echo the testimony of the Legal Aid Society and my fellow public defenders, and also just want to highlight and uh, how critical it is that we center the voices of impacted people uh, in this conversation. Um, I'm going to focus my testimony today on the legislation requiring comprehensive data collection on vehicle stops. Um, vehicle stops are some of the most common interactions New Yorkers have with the NYPD. And in 2020 alone, the NYPD issued over a half a million moving violations. Many traffic stops don't end with a warning or a ticket though. Our clients are arrested, placed in handcuffs, their vehicles confiscated and forced to come to court. Each stop creates the risk of family separation, job loss, housing instability, missed school, driver's license suspension, and police violence, such as in the tragic case of Alan Police. And every police interaction puts non-citizen New Yorkers at risk of negative immigration consequences and even deportation. The current data provided by the NYPD is inadequate and doesn't cover 
thousands of police contacts that don't result in a summons or arrest. It is critical that the city track all traffic stops, regardless of whether traffic summons is issued or an arrest is made. The data collected and analyzed by the Driven by Justice Coalition, where the Bronx Defenders is a leader and which led to the successful effort to pass state legislation, ending the cruel and counterproductive practice of suspending driver's licenses for unpaid traffic debt, shows why a thorough accounting of traffic stops is so critical in the city. From 2015 to 2019, the Bronx Defenders represented close to 12,000 people charged with driving on a suspended license alone. Licenses suspended for traffic debt force people into an impossible decision to miss work or lose a job, miss medical appointments in school, or disrupt family obligations or risk arrest. The harms of these traffic stops, as with all things in the criminal legal system, fall overwhelmingly and disproportionately on communities of color. People of color are pulled over, ticketed, arrested, charged, and convicted at higher rates than their white counterparts. While 76% of drivers in New York City are white, 80% of people arrested for driving on a suspended license in New, York, uh, in New York City were Black or Latinx. In the city, the driver's license suspension rate in the zip codes with the highest concentration of people of color is two and a half times higher than in the zip codes with the most concentrated white populations. The problem is particularly pronounced in the Bronx where we practice and where, which is home to many of the most severely impacted zip codes in the city. But we need to take a step back. The conversation today makes clear that the bills under consideration, while many of them are positive additions and important improvements, are insufficient to bring about the deep structural and transformative change that the NYPD truly needs. Data collection about traffic stops is important, but we need to dramatically reduce the footprint of policing and traffic stops and across the board and make massive investments in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Next up will be Sergio De La Pava, followed by Alex Alexandra Fisher, followed by Jimmy Mager from Safe Horizon. Starting time. Uh, good afternoon. I'm the legal director of New York County Defender Services, a public defender office in Manhattan. I want to thank you uh, both for this hearing and for this opportunity to uh, give the perspective of our, of our client communities. Um, we certainly welcome and we'll, we'll give specific feedback on, on what's under consideration today in our written testimony, but I'd just rather take uh, my oral opportunity here to speak about the general issues um, that are being brought up today. Uh, I think it's a welcome realization on our part that you know, we're starting to realize that policing in this country is broken. The number of people arrested, the number of people incarcerated, the amount of force, including deadly force, far outstrips what we see in other countries. Um, and New York is no exception. Um, certainly we welcome the late coming reforms to New York that began or at least are highlighted by the governor's executive order last year, um, by many of the things under consideration today, which we support. Um, but there's also a sense as somebody who's been on the ground for a quarter century um, in the criminal justice system of this city, uh, that these are band-aids that aren't really going to address the overwhelming issue that New York finds itself in, which is um, the NYPD is, is a one of a kind police department in this country. The NYPD's budget, for example, is about five and a half billion dollars a year. Um, this is a budget that exceeds the state budget of four states in this country. Uh, New York NYPD is massive. It's 33,000 officers, about 18,000 other employees. Um, they have great power. And, and I think a lot of what we're seeing today um, is what happens, a lot of the animosity that's being brought up, a lot of the opposition to these reforms is what happens when you challenge absolute power. And, and for the decades that I've been firsthand witness to it, that's what the NYPD has had, absolute power. I can tell you that I know there's a lot of discussion about public safety. You can't have public safety without um, the trust of the community. And in my experience in dealing with my clients, you know, our office has probably dealt with 300,000 people charged with crimes in, in the city. The trust between the communities that are over-policed and the NYPD is negligible to zero. It really is. 
Um, and when, from the perspective of a public defender, you know, we are the adversary of the NYPD. We understand that. We are the ones who are charged with this sacred obligation to ensure that our clients' constitutional rights are not violated. And while we are, you know, going up against this behemoth, we find our resources uh, can't possibly compete with this uh, entity in any way, in any meaningful way. So I ask you to remember as well um, and to start addressing, and thank you, I'll sum up real quickly, the special role that public defender offices play in our adversarial system and the need to properly fund them and give them the tools. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up will be Alexandra Fisher. Time, sirs. My name is Alexandra Fisher, and I am a senior trial attorney with the criminal defense practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. I want to thank the Committee on Public Safety and Chair Adams for holding this hearing today. And I want to thank you for allowing Ms. Rivera to speak first. Thank you, Ms. Rivera. BDS fully sub supports the pre-considered proposals, and we echo the positions of advocates calling for a fully independent investigation and dis disciplinary process. When the police are not held accountable, victims of police misconduct, primarily black and brown New Yorkers, suffer twice. First, from the police practices inflicted upon them, and then again through the city's failure to deliver any semblance of accountability to their abusers. As defenders, we see officers with long histories of civil rights abuses continue to police the same streets, harm the same community members, and bring new cases for the prosecution. We also see these harms compounded by retaliatory actions taken by officers against people who lodge complaints against them or their colleagues, discouraging future victims from coming forward at all. This behavior is enabled in part due to the complicity of the police commissioner who can and regularly does reject and downgrade CCRB and internal recommendations for disciplining officers. One analysis of CCRB released data found that 260 incidents in 260 instances between 2014 and 2018 alone, the commissioner overruled, downgraded, or dismissed cases where serious misconduct by police was substantiated by the CCRB and charges were recommended. In 2019, the rate of disagreement, uh, sorry, the rate of agreement between the CCRB and NYPD uh, was 51% for most cases, but in more serious cases of alleged misconduct, it was less than 32%. Individual officers engage in and perpetuate racism, bias, physical abuse, and the use of hate speech with the knowledge that the department will not hold them accountable. With confidence, the legal system is designed to prioritize them above their victims. Police misconduct persists at both an institutional and individual level from the very top of NYPD's hierarchy to the very bottom. The police will always refuse to police themselves and there are currently few meaningful legal protections for victims of their abuse. It is also important to remember that the modern NYPD has been reformed many times to negligible result. Removing the police commissioner's final authority over NYPD discipline is one step towards accountability. However, CCRB complaints and the commissioner involvement is only a fraction of the bigger picture of NYPD abuse, misconduct, impunity, and only one part of NYPD's disciplinary process, when there even is one. We must not allow this issue, issue to be framed as That's one of, only, of needing to discipline a few police officers in individual cases. The culture of abusive policing, antipathy towards police communities, and unaccountability are pervasive within the NYPD. We commend the city council for taking important steps to remove disciplinary authority from NYPD, which has continued to make a mockery of the accountability process. These reforms, however, must not be seen as a substitute for working to shrink the scope of policing, reduce NYPD budgets, and invest in proven community solutions. Thank you for the opportunity and I welcome any questions. For your testimony. Next up will be Jimmy Mager followed, uh, from Safe Horizon, followed by Michael Sasitsky from NYCLU, followed by Andrew Case from Latino Justice. And I'll just remind any council members to use the Zoom hand raise function if they have any questions. I'm first now. 
Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony before the Committee on Public Safety. My name is Jimmy Marr, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm policy director at Safe Horizon, the nation's largest nonprofit victim services organization. Safe Horizon offers a client-centered, trauma-informed response to 250,000 New Yorkers each year who've experienced violence or abuse. And we are increasingly using a lens of racial equity to guide our work with clients, with each other, and in developing the positions we hold. For more than 40 years, Safe Horizon has existed to support victims of violence and abuse. We have always been an organization that recognizes and helps survivors to heal from many types of violence. We have staff and programs in every borough and every community across New York City, including during normal times, at every police precinct, every family justice center, and every child advocacy center. Throughout our history, we have found value in partnering with law enforcement. Through those partnerships, we have worked with police officers and prosecutors to keep victims safe and hold those who cause harm accountable. We have advocated for policy and practice changes to make these systems more responsive to our clients, and we have prided ourselves on bringing greater respect, compassion, and self-determination to survivors involved in the criminal justice process through our client-centered approach to advocacy. Because of our partnership with the NYPD, Safe Horizon was able to engage and support more than 50,000 victims of crime last year alone. Yet the reality is that our law enforcement partners have also caused harm, and we have not done all we could to stop that harm or even name it for what it is, racism, systemic and sometimes individual racism. Black and brown people, especially men and transgender women, are far more likely to be killed by the police and to experience violence at the hands of police officers, and they face bias and inequity in every aspect of the criminal justice system. We didn't just learn this because of the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many, too many other black men and women. Our clients have been telling us about these realities for years. Too many of the victims and survivors we serve and too many of our colleagues and loved ones have had encounters with police officers that were dehumanizing. We know that these experiences are a profound barrier to safety and healing. We hear, for example, from black women experiencing domestic violence who agonize over whether to call the police because their experience tells them the response may include excessive force. We hear from black and brown men and boys who will not turn to the police when they are in danger because in their experience, this has not been a safe or viable option. Safe Horizon's mission is to provide support, prevent violence and promote justice for victims of crime and abuse, their families and communities. We believe that confronting and ultimately dismantling systemic racism is necessary to fulfilling our mission because systemic racism denies justice and is rooted in violence. We are grateful that the city council has introduced this package of police reform bills. These bills are a promising start. and We agree with the spirit of this package of legislation, but the way we as a city operate must adapt and change to meet this moment. Our systems, the ones we rely on to respond to harm and violence must fundamentally change and approach this work with nonviolence, compassion and understanding rather than escalation and additional violence. Safe Horizon supports Reso 1539, we support Intro 2209, we support Intro 1671, and we support Intro 2220. And we also support bills in the larger reform package. Um, this is only the beginning. These are only initial steps in building a better, safer, and more just future for all of us. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. For your testimony, uh, next up will be Michael Sosicki, followed by Andrew Case. I'm sorry, Smile. Thank you. My name is Michael Zetsky, Senior Policy Counsel with the NYCLU. Um, I just want to focus on a few of the items on the hearing agenda and make some recommendations as to additional items for the council to consider. First, on Resolution 1538, the NYPD has repeatedly proven incapable of policing itself, but by law, that's the current paradigm. And this is an issue not just in New York City. Our offices throughout the state face similar challenges in trying to bring independent accountability to police disciplinary systems. So we support the resolution and we welcome the council's advocacy with the state legislature. But we also wanna emphasize that the best way to protect New Yorkers is to reduce the number of contacts between police and the public that lead to misconduct in the first place. Disciplinary authority matters, but it comes in after the harm has already been caused, which is why it's so essential to continue identifying ways to reduce the size, scope and power of the NYPD and to invest in non-police alternatives. Um, next on intro 1671, it's crucial to get a complete picture on disparities in vehicle stops, given the potential for escalation and abuse in these encounters. And back in 2017, one of the reasons the NYCLU withdrew support from the police identification bill was because it maintained this higher level of secrecy and impunity in vehicle stops. Uh, so we support this bill. Um, we also call for amendments to make it more comprehensive in the data that we've made available to the public including by providing more detailed information on uh, all types of vehicles that are stopped and to cover all types of enforcement actions arising from vehicle stops and traffic encounters. 
So not just uh, traffic infractions, but also ensuring that we're getting data on any criminal enforcement uh, that arises uh, in connection with a vehicle stop. Um, on intro 2220, qualified immunity is a major obstacle in federal litigation to holding officers accountable. And while federal action is ultimately needed to fully address this issue, local measures like this can help by providing a separate channel for relief. Uh, but we also must ensure that they're broad enough to cover the full range of police abuse. And um, as my colleague at Legal Aid noted, the NYPD violates much more than just the Fourth Amendment protections included in this bill, um, including 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection, the First Amendment's protections for protests, speech, things like recording police activities. Um, so the bill should be equally comprehensive uh, uh, to take account of those violations. Um, and we also note that even with the partial indemnification structure outlined here, the city still pays and taxpayers will remain on the hook for hundreds of millions of dollars each year in police misconduct cases. So we encourage the council to find ways to ensure that those costs are more directly borne by the police department itself, including by reducing the agency's budget to account for the costs of police misconduct. It's not just about holding individual officers accountable. It also needs to be about holding the department as a whole accountable for the culture it promotes and condones among its officers. And lastly, we suggest a few additions to the council's overall legislative package. Uh, we urge the council to amend and pass intro 1551. This bill was first heard at a public safety committee hearing back in 2019 and remains pending. That it was meant fine. to codify, um, I'll briefly wrap up on uh, this and just one other quick point. Um, it was meant to codify an agreement to expand reporting on all consent searches under the Right to Know Act. Uh, but at that hearing, the NYPD confirmed that its officers were not actually following the Right to Know Act requirements uh, in cases where officers were conducting DNA searches on the basis of so-called consent. Um, and that the NYPD could be collecting DNA information from the public without following basic guidelines in local law or reporting on those encounters is alarming and we need the council to act to swiftly uh, amend and pass intro 1551 to clarify that these instances need to be documented. And last point, uh, we also urge the council to introduce and pass legislation to require reporting on investigative encounters below the formal level of a legal stop. Um, so what are known as level one and level two encounters. These encounters are not documented in the same way as stop and frisk, despite the fact that many people's experience of these encounters aren't all that different. Um, we know, and the court reported the monitor has, uh, in the stop and frisk litigation, has confirmed that NYPD is underreporting the total number of stops that continue to take place. And the only way that we're going to understand the full picture of what these practices look like in communities and to ensure, is to ensure that the department doesn't have an out in what kind of encounters it's required to report on or not. Uh, so we hope to see the council introduce and pass legislation uh, on these encounters as part of its overall police reform package. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your indulgence in me going over time. Thank you, Michael. Thank you uh, for the recommendations as well. Thank you. I've, I've written everything down. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up will be Andrew Case, followed by Hercules Reed, followed by Chi Ose. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, Chair Adams, members of the Public Safety Committee. My name is Andrew Case. I am senior counsel at Latino Justice Pearl Def, and I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to testify today. Over-policing harms communities and particularly harms communities of color. Procedural reforms to how New Yorkers are policed, while beneficial, will not solve the policing crisis in this city. In our written testimony, we will address all the bills, uh, including the two items that Michael mentioned, the uh, uh, level one and two stop and the DNA uh, uh, bill, but today I only want to speak about Resolution 1538 and Intro 2220. Regarding 1538, since the CCRB was created in its current form, six police commissioners under three mayors have systemically downgraded CCRB's recommended punishment for officers who broke the law. This happened when I started working at the CCRB in 1997 and has continued to this day. The new NYPD disciplinary matrix will not change matters. The penalties suggested by the matrix are uniformly low. If an officer is found to have stopped and searched someone illegally, for example, the standard matrix punishment is to forfeit three vacation days. And in any event, the NYPD has granted itself the power to depart from the matrix if it so chooses. The city and the NYPD say they will only depart from the matrix in, quote, extraordinary circumstances, but the NYPD's 
treatment of cases where the CCRB proves that officers lie show how frequently the department invokes such exceptions. Section 203-08 of the NYPD patrol guide states that, quote, intentionally making a false official statement regarding a material matter will result in dismissal from the department absent exceptional circumstances, but the NYPD ignores the vast majority of cases in which the CCRB finds an officer lied. There is no reason to think it will act any differently under the disciplinary matrix. Latino justice therefore strongly supports removing disciplinary authority from the NYPD. And I wanna add, I heard earlier someone talk about how outside people don't generally discipline. The state bar can discipline me regardless of what my employer says and every attorney in the state. So it's quite common for people to have outside uh, discipline for their professions. The proposed resolutions, however, even if passed, will not solve the problem entirely. Even if the state legislature changes the law, the council must revise administrative code section 14.115, likely must amend section 434 of the charter for disciplinary authority to change hands. Latino Justice Pearl Defs calls upon the council to do so so that authority may pass as soon as the state acts. Qualified immunity protects officers who engage in gross acts of misconduct. Justice Sotomayor has written that the doctrine was, quote, sanctions a shoot first, think later approach to policing. Latino justice unequivocally supports the repeal of qualified immunity. As others have stated, this bill will not fully repeal qualified immunity. I wanna make I'm one sorry. additional point very quickly, that it does not require the NYPD to implement lessons of litigation. The OIG for the NYPD has requested repeatedly that the NYPD use data from last lawsuits to revise its policies and practices, and the NYPD has been slow to adapt. Only one example of this. In 2004, the NYPD surrounded and arrested a group of demonstrators who were protesting the Republican National Convention. The department was sued. The city paid millions of dollars. And on June 4th of this summer, the NYPD, supervised by the same officer, once again kettled peaceful demonstrators and according to the DOI report on last summer's protest, it continues to use kettling as a policy while calling it encirclement. Any uh, litigation data should, in addition to issues of qualified immunity, be used to revise policies and practices. I wanna thank you for your time and thank you for allowing me to go a little bit over. Thank you for your testimony. Next up will be Hercules Reed, followed by Chi Ose, followed by Jeff Strabone. I'm starts now. Hello, my name is Hercules Reed, and I speak on behalf of Strategy for Black Lives, a youth-led organizing group in New York City fighting for Black liberation. A collective of current and former student leaders, we understand the need to be strategic, to, success, to, be, to succeed in and maintaining this fight. We continue to both march in the streets and advocate for policy in the halls of power. The imaginations and voices of change for generations have, poured the, have powered the tides to bring us to this point as a city and nation. Civil rights heroes like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass fought, bled, and died for the abolition of slavery. Often people hear the word abolition and cringe. We understand that there is no public safety without trust. We do not trust Commissioner Shea as a leader and believe his resignation would also assist in the healing the city needs right now. His lack of leadership and neglect over time led to the continued false arrests and violations of our rights as protesters protected by the first, fourth and 14th amendments. And yet he is protected by immunity, not accountability. A 2020 Forbes article read, just last year qualified immunity was granted to Fresno officers accused of stealing more than 225,000 during a search. Idaho police who bombarded an innocent woman's home with tear gas and grenades and a Georgia officer who tried to kill a family's dog, but accidentally shot a 10 year old boy instead, all because the rights involved weren't clearly established. Police should not be the Donald Trump of public safety. Finding ways to avert the law and, and disenfranchise people at will. We have seen what happens when people believe they are above the law. Absolute or qualified immunity granted to public safety officers, a defense in practice that is abhorrent, presents clear conflict for people they are sworn to protect. The murders of Mike Brown, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Eric Garner at the hands of police reflect a flawed system to discipline and or hold accountable officers for malpractice. Having civil protections as a citizen, having civil protections as a citizen is essential 
to building trust and a cornerstone of democracy. Having the ability to hold police accountable by a fair trial is the only clear sign that no one is above the law. Countless videos of police abusing their authority exist, and yet here we are endeavoring to have human rights. It is already their word against ours, and if their action didn't violate clearly established rights, they walk free. Historically, it is, has created a pattern where officers feel legally and politically protected from being held liable for violating human rights. This is not about restitution. It is about building trust back. Everyone needs boundaries with consequences that make them second guess before acting irrational. And qualified immunity now, it is not a defense. We look forward to working with the Public Safety Committee to reform and reimagine public safety as we support the current Thank proposal. Inspired. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reed. And I, I just want to say, uh, Mr. Reed, you represent youth very well. I appreciate your time today and I appreciate you appearing before this committee and providing your testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll now turn to Chi Ose, followed by Jeff Strabone, followed by Tanya Cruz. Time starts now. Thank you. Since 1845, the culture of policing in New York City has been confusing. The finest are here to protect and serve. The finest are trained to stop crime and apprehend people who commit crimes. But to achieve these respectable goals, the NYPD has allowed itself to become too big. 